clearly the banking system is telling us that there's some kind of issue here. And I would say, Lisa, that money has been shut down. The banking system for the first time really is dealing with negative deposit growth year over year. We don't see this as a systemic crisis, nothing compared to 08, 09 or 1990. I cannot believe that what's happening in the banking sector will not give the Fed pause in this market. This is almost like the opposite of the global financial crisis. And now the fears are way out there when the banks are more resilient than they've been in a generation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a weekend. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance <laughs> on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Bramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures on the S&P 500 just about unchanged. The breaking news late Sunday, the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC said it will wind down Silicon Valley Bank in a way that, quote, Tom, fully protects all depositors. We know the one question everyone was asking themselves over the weekend, where do we bank? And do we need to open a new account come Monday morning? We can open a new account Monday morning. And, John, what's really important here is we are now global. What we have now, John, different than the weekend festivities, is markets tick by tick to give us a score. I'm going to call it Systemic Crisis Monday, as uh, Gerard Cassidy talked about in the opening. He will join us here, Greg Peters, in moments. Got goosebumps, Greg Peters, with us. I mean, that's who you want to talk to here. But there'll be a lot of explanation and understanding of where we are now that the markets are open. Let's just put this stock market to one side. Capturing yes. this stress, this tension, <clears throat> the front end of the yield curve in America, and I would go one further worldwide, have a look at Buns this morning, these moves are absolutely phenomenal. On Wednesday, day two of Chairman Powell's semi-annual testimony, the two-year yield is at 5.08%. This morning, it dropped below 420. We've got a move this morning, Lisa, of 36 basis points lower. That is an aggressive move to kick off the week. Over the past three trading sessions, the move that you've seen in the two-year rivals, what we saw back in 2001 after 9-11, that's the kind of scale of move that we're seeing. So this is the question. Does what we're seeing with banking system stress cause the Federal Reserve to materially pull back how much they raise rates to combat inflation. And what does that do to inflation at a time where that's still an issue, but the stresses of the banking system are something that clearly the federal government is not ignoring? So Goldman Sachs say no hike this month, and they've got absolutely no clue. You can include me in this as well as to what happens after March in the next few meetings as well. The announcement from the central bank is equally as interesting here. The Federal Reserve announced the new bank term funding program that offers one-year loans to other banks in America under much, much easier terms. Don't want to involve too much jargon in the early part of the conversation, but they're now going to accept collateral at par, securities that are deeply, deeply underwater. And I understand the aversion to using the phrase bailout this morning. But if you are a bank that hasn't failed... And if you have been run poorly and you haven't managed interest rate risk and you have this massive pool of securities deeply underwater, that's one heck of a lifeline the Fed's just thrown you, isn't it? They basically are keeping the depositors whole at a time when a number of banks invested in assets that are deeply underwater to your point that would take deep haircuts because they don't want to stem a fire sale. They don't want to stem panic. A, will this be enough to truly stem panic? And B, what does this do in terms of both uh, the moral hazard, but also with respect to fighting inflation, well, uh, given that it's supposed to come from tighter financial uh, conditions? I, I would partition this, and as we dive into this through all the surveillance this morning, I would partition it into different themes that overlay. But to the machinery that the Secretary of Treasury uh, announced yesterday, John, basically it's a one-year repo, which is jargon for you get a one-year grace period. And basically it's saying, you guys screwed up with your bond portfolios, bring them in, we'll give you 100 cents on the dollar for one year. They have to pay some nominal fee along the way, I don't understand. But the answer is it's one year. And they're audible here, John, if this falls apart, they can easily extend it out to two years. That hasn't been talked about. It's going to be talked about, I imagine, Tom, <clears throat> over the next several weeks. The regulatory snapback, there's going to be a big conversation Huge. about that too, Tom, in a monster way. Let's rip, whip through the price section <laughs> yeah. just briefly. Start with equities. Futures were elevated. They've totally faded since then. Futures right now just about positive by two-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Here's the move on a 10-year. It's a 15 basis point move on a 10-year, but the move on a two-year is just phenomenal. 35 basis points lower on a two-year yield this morning. Not just the story in America. You can take a look at the bond market as well. Do you remember those calls for a 50 basis point move from the ECB a little bit later this week? I guess the uh, the takeaway now is we'll see.
see. We've got to move a 33, 34 basis points lower on a German two-year. We were looking at 3%, Tom. We're now at 273 on a German two-year. The full faith and credit monitor is great to watch because it's clearly the deepest market, but there are the idiosyncrasies out there right now, whether it's First Republic of California. Uh, we've been talking about that all morning down major. But, John, I'm sorry. I'm going to look at Credit Suisse here opening. We all know the story. It's a beleaguered bank caught up in this maelstrom. And I would like to know what Swiss authorities do as the New York insurance authorities uh, did for Signature Bank with a vengeance yesterday afternoon. A lower the session on Credit Suisse, 211. The stock is down by more than 11 percent right here, right now at 2 22. We are talking about record lows for that bank. Let's start the conversation. Greg Peters, co-CIO of PGM Fixed Income, joins us right now. Greg, let's start with this. What do you make of what's unfolding this morning? Well, it's just another source of volatility in a highly volatile market. This is not a great backdrop to invest. You talk about the moves in U.S. Treasuries. The move in two years is absolutely astounding. And speaking of moves, the move index has basically almost retraced to all the move uh, lower. That actually helped fuel the rally. So to me, you can't have a well-functioning market with such high volatility, plain and simple. Uh, Greg Peters, what would you like to see from our institutional authorities? You know, you hide it, but I believe you're old enough to remember uh, 2008. And I remember that institutions with a vengeance stepped up almost on a daily, if not hourly basis. The president scheduled in the 8 o'clock hour to speak. What do you need to hear from Chairman Powell? What do you need to hear from Secretary Yellen? Well, so I think this is very different. I'm sure a lot of guests have said the same thing, but I think this is very different today than 2008 or even the uh, SNL crisis, which uh, uh, I was a part of, unfortunately. But the, but you know, this is not systemic. I don't believe. Uh, but to me, there's lots of questions on the table. I think the regulatory authorities uh, have to be uh, called out here. Um, and to me, it's just poor asset liability mismatch, um, plain and simple. Greg, I, it's a question that we're going to go through all today. And, and folks, I just think it's just so important. George Saravellis at Deutsche Bank with a sharp morning note making clear he thinks CPI really doesn't matter tomorrow. There's so much going on in the Greg Peters world. Greg, if that's the case, should the Fed step aside? Should they go a la Greenspan and suddenly become measured or, dare I say, stabilize or lower the rate? Well, I think that conjures up Arthur Burns. So, no, I don't see that as a uh, possibility uh, at this point. What happens in March, I don't know. Uh, but at the end of the day, the Fed has to keep inflation under control. That's the main focus here. So this might be a bump in the road. Uh, but ultimately, the path is clear that the Fed uh, has to get inflation down. And that's what I would focus on more than anything else. Well, Greg, a lot of the people uh, who right now are trying to predict what the Fed is going to do believe that the Fed will raise one more time and that's it, possibly not any more time. So we're looking at a Fed funds rate, terminal rate that's priced in at 4.8 percent down from nearly 5.8, 5.7 percent Thursday. I'm curious from your vantage point, where do you weigh in on this? How do you trade this if you think the market is wrong and the Fed's going to keep going? Well, I, I think it's really difficult. That's the point here, is that the volatility is so extreme that it's really difficult to stay in any position, right? Just think about the move in the two-year, right? The, uh, it's just astounding. So I think it's really hard to take uh, uh, big bets here. You have to be close to home. So on the duration side, we're very close to home. We're not making large uh, investments uh, out the curve or even in the front end because the volatility is too extreme and it introduces too much volatility uh, into your fixed income portfolio. How concerning is it to you, Greg, that we're still seeing the shares of a number of medium-sized banks and even the largest banks, although to a much lesser degree, sell off this morning even after the programs put into place? Does that indicate uh, something to you about the level of volatility, how long it's going to last and the direction it could take? No, I think it's more of a snap reaction. Um, I think the uh, SIPI banks are, in, or GSIP banks are in a very different place than you know the regional community banks. I think the market will continue to suss that out. Uh, but you know, if you go back to uh, SVB, it was an outlier in almost every metric that um, one could look at. So to me, it's far from systemic. I think this is just a, a snap reaction more than anything else.
Greg, we're looking at a yield curve right now, and typically when we observe the yield curve, we'll say things like it's steeper, we'll say it's inverted. What's important and isn't talked about enough, it's how it steepens, it's how it inverts, it's how it flattens, and right now it's steepening aggressively, but led by the front end. Now, the jargon, <sighs> Greg, as you know, for people who don't follow the bond market, they might not know, that's called the bull steepener. Now, Greg, when you start to see that develop, is that a wolf in sheep's clothing for people looking at that, observing that and saying, this is great, Fed's going to hike less. This is great. They may even cut interest rates. When you see that bull steepener, that aggressive, Greg, what does that usually signal? Well, I think it signals that the uh, Fed is uh, um, on the precipice of cutting, uh, and I don't see that. So uh, to me, the move in the yield curve uh, um, is curious. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I still think inflation is the, the, the issue here. The Fed is not going to back away from that. So one bank out in California having struggled maybe a few more doesn't change the fact that we have uh, uh, inflation still above trend here and that has to come down and that means more hikes not less hikes so to me uh, the move in the yield curve uh, um, is curious and i don't think it'll hold to be honest with you greg can i take it one step further how much of this move this morning is just about risk aversion about taking out fed hikes how much of it is about people waking up and saying you know what don't like my bank deposits i'm just going to run into the front end of the curve and sit here for a while I don't know if it's that. I would. I think it's more just a hedge, right? So uh, investors don't have a lot of uh, hedge vehicles out there. I think using the two-year, the ten-year, you know, treasuries uh, do do provide that protection. Uh, so I think it's as, as simple as that. I don't think it's like oh, I'm taking money out of the bank and putting in the two years. I don't see that necessarily. So. Uh, to me, it's just a portfolio hedge trade that's going through the market right now. Well, it's going through the market in a monster way. Greg, thanks for being with us. Greg Peters there of Pigeon Fixed Income. We're working our way through the bond market at the moment with the two-year yield down 34 basis points. I'll keep going back to this. Wednesday, 5.08%. Tom, this morning, 423 I think five is a round number. People looking for 6%, but the answer is 5% is where things changed. Looking forward to the conversation in the next hour. Gerard Cassidy, the head of U.S. Bank, equity researcher, RBC Capital Markets, coming up shortly. Equity futures right now, totally unchanged. Unchanged does not tell you the story no. of the weekend. More still to come from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Bloomberg has learned Russian President Vladimir Putin plans to meet top business leaders in the Kremlin this week for the first time since he launched the invasion of Ukraine. The March 16th gathering with the top members of the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs comes as the government, which is struggling to cover rising spending as the war enters its second year, steps up pressure on companies to pay more in taxes. Reuters reports Chinese President Xi Jinping plans to travel to Moscow to meet Putin as soon as next week. No other details are immediately available. China's foreign ministry did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Xi Jinping has started an unprecedented third term as China's president with fresh vows to ensure stability and strengthen party leadership. In a speech closing out the annual National People's Congress, he vowed to oppose foreign interference in Taiwan, a veiled reference to increasing American support for the government in Taipei. We should implement our party's overall policy for resolving the Taiwan question in the new era, uphold the One China principle, and stick to the 1992 consensus. We should violently oppose the interference of external forces and secessionist activities of Taiwan independence. To Japan, where mask wearing is optional, making the country one of the last places to ease rules around face coverings. Authorities will continue to recommend their use at hospitals, nursing homes, on trains and buses during rush hour. The island nation plans to reclassify COVID-19 to bring it in line with seasonal influenza from May 8th. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
This already feels like we've got a long week ahead of us, doesn't it? Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all just tuning in. Equity futures just about turning lower, negative by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. And presidented over the weekend, everyone all together, the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC. It's been a while since we had the opportunity to say that, TK, looking to shore up the financial industry in the United States of America. And do it in real time with the immediacy that's needed, which is to get trust and confidence back into the system and also to begin to think about, John, where are we heading? What did we get wrong here? And what do we need to do to fix it? Maybe feeling a bit 2009. That $250,000 FDIC limit, Tom, did we just scrap I've that overnight? I've always felt it was way low. It was an insult to hardworking upper middle class and have a lot more than... 250,000 should it be adjusted up, but should it be adjusted up to 40 million because I'm on my Gulf Stream from Montana and can't decide whether to land at SFO or Palo Alto. To put this into perspective, 95% of all of the deposits <clears throat> at Silicon Valley Bank were above the 250,000 insured limit because this was a lot of smaller businesses and this is where they were going to meet payroll with, right? At other banks, it was only about a third of all depositors that have accounts above that. But you're right. How much does this change the scenario for for banks that are regulated under a very different set of parameters. And suddenly, what's the other side of this? Do they have to pay more for that insurance? So over the weekend, I think we all know there was a basic question a lot of Americans were asking themselves, whether they need to do open a new bank account come Monday morning. In a larger firm. The idea at Sunday evening was to make sure those kind of decisions weren't made, that people would stay put. And if they were made, that those banks could ultimately meet those flows. And that was the new funding facility announced by the Federal Reserve. What we're seeing this morning, though, you still see some single names Lisa, some of these banks still down hard in the pre-market. Let's draw a distinction, though, and this is my question. I don't know the answer to it. How much is this concerned about systemic risk and some sort of run on a bank, and how much is this concerned about profitability? Banks having to pay that mm -hmm. much more, giving that basically telling depositors, we will give you much bigger rates, increase the deposit beta in order to keep your your uh, your assets, and then, oh, yeah, that crimps our margins, that crimps our profitability. Yields getting absolutely slammed here. <clears throat> Down 34% uh -oh. on a two-year, Tom. 34 basis points, rather, on a two-year. 4.24% on a two-year yield this morning. A movable, a movable feast on radio and television. We'll do more data checks here uh, through the morning, particularly in the fixed income, that deepest of markets of the mood of the moment. Our goal at Surveillance, and John and I talked about this over the weekend, is not only to look at the immediacy and the breaking news, we'll have that uh, for you, but also to look at where we're heading. We have Thomas Michaud with us later from Keith Briette and Woods. Gerard Cassidy will join us here in moments with decades of experience, including living 2008 in real time. And we begin this discussion this morning on your future in banking with Myra Rodriguez Valadares, Managing Principal at MRV Associates. You may not know her, but what you need to know, she is steeped in the banking discussion of Washington. Myra, thank you so much for joining us in the six o'clock hour. I'm going to cut to the chase. The Republicans, led by President Trump, are highly suspect of bank concentration. It's Donald Trump channeling his inner Andrew Jackson. I get it. Did that all go by the wayside yesterday? And will the Republicans have to find common ground with the Democrats to make us a one banking system? Well, it's good to see you again, and thank you so much for having me here. Look, uh, most unfortunately, uh, what's just happened this weekend is that venture capital and those kinds of companies have been bailed out. And this never should have happened. The Republicans, primarily, although unfortunately some Democrats back in 2018, voted for the EGR CCPA. Yes, one more alphabet soup of American regulations and laws. But once that vote came in, it revoked important liquidity and stress testing requirements for those banks exactly around the uh, size of what Silicon Valley Bank is. So, yes, Republicans <clears throat> should be finding common ground with Democrats now right. to revoke that useless piece of legislation, which ended up being incredibly damaging yet again to unsuspecting ordinary Americans. Can we expand too big to fail constructively across the regionals, the super regionals, even some of the larger institutions state by state? Or do we need to expand it for each and every community bank? Yeah, excellent question, Tom. No, it, we really need to go back to Title I Dodd-Frank that was signed back in 2010. At that time, 
those institutions that are $50 billion and over were considered systemically important. And yes, you can have domestically systemically important banks. You can have the regional ones. Of course, you have the ones the size of JP Morgan, which are globally systemically important banks. And even these so-called smaller banks, I don't call it 200 and some odd billion dollar institution like Silicon Valley Bank, uh, small, even those kinds of institutions. We just saw this weekend how much instability and chaos they can cause to ordinary Americans who didn't even know that all of this was, was going on. And so those institutions should never have been uh, changed. In other words, their designation never should have been changed. Well, Mara, whether they like it or not, hasn't Washington, D.C. acknowledged that you're right overnight by using the systemic risk exception for smaller banks? Right, exactly, unfortunately. And I really hate to be right on this one. Uh, quite a number of consumer advocates and myself for decades have been arguing that it is important to pay close attention to those regional banks. By definition, they are concentrated in their assets and in their liabilities. Uh, the fact that Silicon Valley was not properly analyzing how concentrated it was in its deposits, and some of those, as some of you have mentioned in the previous program, were enormous. All it takes is one or two of those tech companies to withdraw their deposits, to get on their phones, with our friends telling them, hey, I think there's a problem at a particular bank. And next thing you know, we had a just old fashioned uh, run on the bank. You also had uh, people on Twitter who should have really known better. Uh, billionaire hedge fund uh, managers, really fear, monger fear mongering. And none of that, none of that was necessary. But at the end of the day, this is the fault of the executives at SVB. And the SEC needs to investigate why is it that they were selling thousands and thousands of their own shares just a couple of weeks ago? And why weren't they at least doing minimal interest rate risk management and liability uh, risk measurements? Well, a lot of people are trying to say this is highly idiosyncratic for all the reasons that you just said. First Bank in California, those shares down almost 60 percent. Comerica shares down almost 7.5 percent in pre-market trading. This is following some of the moves that we saw last week. Fifth Third, I mean, a number of the bigger uh, small banks, regional banks, are really struggling. So how idiosyncratic is this, or is there a larger problem that we're going to see come to the fore in the days ahead? The problem is, yes, a, a couple of days ago, we could say it's idiosyncratic. The problem is that nobody wants to be the last one in a room turning off the light. In other words, as soon as there's a problem with one bank, fear is real. Immediately, everybody starts to say, wait a minute, should I also have my deposits at bank A, B, C, D, et cetera? So immediately, investors move. You see other banks, bond yields go up which signal to the rest of the market that there's an increasing probability of default and loss severity. Even if the bank is well capitalized, I keep hearing that banks are well capitalized. Yes, the problem is they can quickly go, uh, they can quickly become illiquid, which is really what matters right now. Lehman was single A, it was well capitalized, it was illiquid, it was insolvent. And these things can happen incredibly quickly. That's why there is no way that Silicon Valley Bank and other banks like that should have been allowed to grow that fast. Back in 2015, when Greg Becker was actively advocating for lighter regulations, in 2015, that bank was $40 billion in assets. When it was closed down, it had grown by over 400% to somewhere in the range of $210 billion. So yes, you are going to see a lot of gyrations in the market because investors are nervous. <clears throat> Mara, thanks for being with us. Just fantastic thoughts on the regulatory front and where we're going to go forward from here. Capital economics last night, once this new lending that, yeah. facility was announced over at the Federal Reserve, said this. The shift to accepting collateral at par, rather than making marking to market, means that the banks that have accumulated more than $600 billion in unrealized losses on their How to Maturity Treasury and MBS Securities portfolios and didn't hedge the interest rate risk should be able to ride out the storm. There's always trade-offs, Tom. These are difficult decisions, but there is a sense that some bad management has been rewarded here yes, by this regulatory move. Absolutely. There's a five standard deviation move. We can talk about that later. The answer is yes. Futures right now, just about positive. This is Bloomberg.
nothing to see here looking at equity futures. Of course, there's plenty to see here. Equity futures on the S&P 500, just about positive. Worst week of the year last week on the S&P and on the Nasdaq. Take a close look at the Russell, the small caps in America, down about a half of 1%. Second biggest weighting on the Russell. Unlike, say, the S&P, there's a big weighting towards financials in there on a Russell 2000. So keep a lookout for that. The Russell right now down about four tenths of 1%. Here are the fireworks. Let's get to the bond market. Take a look at the front end of the yield curve. Your two-year last week, 5.08%, the highest since 2007. We were down 20, we're down another 20, we're down another 30. These moves at the front end of the curve are just absolutely phenomenal. We're down almost 30 basis points on a two-year to 4.29.69. That's an 80 basis point move in not even three full sessions. Just amazing. The 10-year <coughs> comes down about 13 or 14 basis points, 3.56. You're seeing a similar move in Germany, let's be clear about that, on a week where people expect the ECB to go 50. <laughs> this is what euro dollar looks like. Euro dollar right now with a two-year yield down 37 points, 37 basis points in Germany. Euro dollar just about holding on. 106.67, firmer there. Lisa, by two tenths of one percent. Over the weekend, people were saying that the reason why uh, they came out with these programs was simply so that they could keep raising rates without there being systemic uh, issues. That the, basically, this gives them more of an ability to go further. Nobody's buying that today. We're seeing the terminal Fed funds rate priced into the market well, at four point eight percent from five point seven percent on Thursday. The conversation will shift, John. Pick up on this, please, because I think you were dead on on it. it. Was yesterday there was a certain tone, and then it shifted sometime when the pre-Oscars started, and it was real simple. Nobody wanted to buy this stuff. There was an assumption Sunday morning that someone, you know, we're moving our watches, daylight savings time, somebody will be there. Yep. And Colby Smith and James Politi lined up the ducks about 9 p.m. last night. Nobody showed up to buy this stuff. In the weeks to come, we'll get the color. In the months to yeah. come, we'll find out what happened throughout the whole of this weekend, Tom. You've got the impression, though, that the Treasury Secretary we heard from on Saturday morning on Face the Nation. <clears throat> what she talked about turned right. out to be somewhat different to what we got later on that evening, Tom, on the Sunday. We need to dive into this. We've got many voices this morning. Again, Gerard Cassidy and Thomas showed on Banking of America coming up. But right now, an incredibly qualified guest, Edward Yardeni is founder and chief investment strategist at Yardeni Research, iconic in the synthesis of our economics into markets, but far more with a passing understanding of the James Tobin School of Economics in New Haven, Connecticut. Ed Yardeni joins us on Yale and learning from Yellen years ago at Yale. Jed, you have known Janet Yellen from the very beginning. What is her character as she confronts this greatest challenge? Well, I think she's a do-gooder. She wants to make sure that uh, this uh, ends well. Uh, so um, I think uh, her initial uh, remarks uh, on Sunday morning uh, suggested that she was going to be uh, somewhat tougher. But you know, once, once she got, sat down with a... Uh, other folks who were involved in these discussions, uh, she came around to the view that uh, depositors uh, at SVB uh, had to be protected, and that's exactly what uh, what they did. Uh, she does tend to be, um, you know, gov government meddler, and uh, as as do other uh, as do other Treasury secretaries and f Fed chairs. Uh, and in this case, uh, they're meddling away. Uh, you know, the 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 ask for bailouts goes right. to. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure whether it's Powell or Yellen, but uh, both, maybe they, they split it. In the early 70s, you talk about Janet Yellen, and I remember this, folks, these treasured Xerox notes. For those of you younger, we won't yep. explain. But Ed Yardeni, Janet Yellen had her Xerox notes. Is there a playbook now for this trauma? This one is a tough one because uh, really at the heart of it uh, is the insurance system for deposits. And uh, that's where... Um, the, the problem lies, and that's why the immediate knee-jerk reaction of the regulatory and uh, monetary authorities was to uh, uh, make sure that depositors at uh, these particularly troubled uh, banks uh, are able to uh, get get to their their funds. Uh, still leaves the big question about uh, how about everybody else, and in in a sense, this is sort of a de facto backup of the entire deposit system of the United States. Uh, and in the Wall Street Journal's warning that. This this is the you know slippery uh, slippery slope down to um, you know just downright um, moral hazard where 
the, the banks get all of their deposits uh, guaranteed by the government. Uh, to build on that and to build on this point that Janet Yellen sounded very different, who do you expect gave her the biggest pushback, given all of your experience working at the Federal Reserve, at the U.S. Treasury Department? Where did it come from? I didn't suspect there wasn't much pushback. I think they were in, in panic mode. I think it's extraordinary how quickly they can put out uh, bailout programs and you know come, come up with four letters to describe them. Uh, and they did that amazingly quickly uh, this time around. But they've had a lot of experience with doing this. And, you know, I, I think we are uh, concluding that uh, this is the, the, the payment for uh, the uh, free money that we had for so many years. Uh, now the Fed's trying to uh, tighten things up and realizing that it's not that easy. And uh, the, the system may need to be shored up in order for them to make this transition more smoothly. They don't want this thing to end uh, badly. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. The market's kind of skeptical. Uh, first, it uh, rallied on the futures markets. Uh, now they kind of give, gave it all back. Uh, but it's going to be um, one heck of a week, that's for sure. Because we also get, remember the economic indicators. Right. Uh, before all this happened, we were worrying about the CPI. Well, um, we may be worrying about the CPI again on Tuesday when it comes out. Um, uh, since it's widely anticipated that it's it's not going to be a, a pretty number. How concerned are you, especially given the fact that, by many accounts, we got a hot labor market print on uh, on Friday. People shrugged it off. They looked at wages instead because it confirmed a narrative that really was more convenient, especially with the banking distress. Now we're looking to a potentially hot CPI print going into if potentially 50 basis point rate hike from the ECB on Thursday. How does the Fed effectively fight inflation if the market is basically telling them they're one and done at this point in terms of rate hikes? Yeah, I think they're going to have to uh, slow down the rate hikes, um, may, may even have to stop here. The, you know, I'm not quite sure that we're going to have a rate hike at all at this uh, next uh, meeting. Uh, certainly, it's not going to be 50 basis points, and we're back to, to 25 basis points. And as you pointed out, the two-year is uh, has suddenly has a completely different uh, lower terminal rate than we had before. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, the Fed is just going to be winging it, uh, which is really what they've been doing all along, right? Um, kind of data dependent, now uh, kind of event dependent. Well, but this is really a concern for people who actually think that inflation is a problem, and you're looking at real yields that are plunging. You're looking at financial conditions that are easing pretty significantly. Right. Are you saying uh, that you think that still it will be effective to curtail inflation? Or are you getting more concerned about inflation picking up and staying higher for longer? Well, I've been thinking for a while here that uh, a good part of the inflation was pandemic related. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the idea of uh, transitory is very relevant to the goods part of inflation. The persistent part of inflation has been in services. And we know that rent inflation's come down quite a bit. And then there's this uh, kind of super core services area that the Fed's uh, focusing on. But I think in that area, you'll see some moderation as well. I, I I sense that there's some resistance by the consumers to the price increases now, and I think there's uh, going to be resistance by uh, employers to uh, increase wages much more than they have. Ed, last time we spoke, you sounded constructive on this equity market. I have to say, the last yeah. six minutes, you don't sound bullish now. Well, it's hard to, uh, given the, 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 the uncertainty created by all this, uh, have to be realistic about uh, what's going on. Uh, but I do think that uh, we're going to get through this. I don't think this is going to uh, lead to a recession. I'm still in the soft landing camp. Uh, I feel uh, stronger than ever uh, in my conviction that uh, the uh, ten-year bond yield peaked at four and a quarter percent back on October 24th, um, and I still think October 12th was the low last year for the S&P 500. Uh, but my level of uh, conviction is obviously lower because I'm realistic here and have to recognize that things have uh, ha have occurred here in the past few days that are relevant. They've changed big time in the last week, that's for sure. Ed, yep. thank you, sir. Ed Yardini of Yardini Research. Much more cautious, Tom, since the last time we spoke to him for good reasons. Yes. Still thinks October, though, was the equity market well, low. Being cautious in crisis, and what crisis means is a strange word, uncertainty, which means there's no mathematics to it. There's no probability distribution, if you will. That's what we call risk. The uncertainty this morning is off the chart. Frankly, the president in the 8 o'clock hour, I don't think is going to get it done. He's going to maybe drive it forward. Maybe he'll have a bit of news. But this is about trust and confidence. And here's the lead. It's about nothing else. We all, have, we all have a responsibility, Tom, not to talk about things like 
bank runs without being super serious about what's developing yeah. in the United States this right now. This goes back to the Depression. It's not funny. At the same time, we have to observe some of the price action that's developing in single <clears throat> names. First Republic in the pre-market is down by more than 70% at the moment, TK. They're not alone. There's other names as well. Credit Suisse is getting hammered over in Europe and Switzerland. But, Tom, some of these single-name bank moves this morning still, right. I think there was a hope after the moves that were announced yesterday that perhaps we'd get a bounce in some of this stuff. I don't see that right now. I don't see the bounce, and you need to work out the troubled banks, and they will decide. The people in the markets will decide, but far more. Can you imagine the different types of people in a more bank bank than Silicon Valley, like First Republic or others? The choice set families have in the kitchen this morning. The choice set they have on the phone. They're both at work. Yep. The choice set a small business has. I'm sorry, these are not where I am. These are not big decisions. It's like move. The Wall Street Journal had a great article, Lisa, over the weekend. Guys on cell phones, you know, fancy people on cell phones jetting around the West and anecdotally or what they were doing to get kajillions out of Silicon Valley. Wednesday is payroll day for a lot of these companies. They need to have the cash to meet payroll. And that's the question that they had was, are they going to be able to meet payroll? And it seems like what the Federal Reserve has done, what the Treasury Department has done is say, yes, you can. But at what cost? And I think that that is what we're trying to figure out. Basically, is this a blanket statement? We now insure all deposits. Or is there going to be some cost to banks for extra insurance or potentially who could potentially bid on these assets and at what price? Yeah, this morning and this week is not about the banks that have failed. It's about everyone else. And to Tom's point, going into the weekend, the number one question for so many people across this country is whether they needed to move bank and open a new bank account. The question we had on Friday from a market perspective was just basically who's next, who's vulnerable here. Waking up this morning after the regulatory moves we saw yesterday, Tom, the policy effort, the question this morning is have they done enough? Is that enough? Well, and what the magnitude will be, I think, more than anything. And I, I was sort of surprised the, the one-year repo, the B... The BTEF, whatever it is, the, the term, I'm killing it, John, term funding agreement. The new facility. The new, Thank you. That will go with that. The new sure. facility <laughs> um, I thought was sort of small, so I wonder if that will expand will be maybe the first measurement of magnitude. Just too many acronyms, TK. It is. Uh, I'm with you. Just way too much. Futures right now, just about positive by a tenth of 1% on the S&P, but in the bond market, just monster, monster moves. Yield to lower on a two-year in America by more than 30 basis points. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Norway, NATO forces are gathered for joint drills as a defense alliance, along with Russia, China and others, compete for greater control of the Arctic. Estimates suggest the region holds around one-fourth of the globe's oil and natural gas resources. Meanwhile, Ukraine's interior minister says Russian missiles and artillery have destroyed more than 152,000 residential buildings since the start of the invasion. In his first public comment since taking office, Premier Li Zhang says China will protect the rights of entrepreneurs and continue to support private businesses. He also downplayed the importance of Beijing's modest economic growth target of around 5 percent, saying citizens are more focused on issues that affect their daily lives rather than the pace of gross domestic product. U.S., Australia and U.K. leaders will announce plans to a new fleet of nuclear-powered submarines as they deepen the AUKUS defense partnership aimed at countering China in the Pacific. Upgrading Australia's aging subfleet is a linchpin that in the, of that effort. Now, President Biden will meet in San Diego today with U.K. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to unveil plans to develop that new submarine. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The correct statement that the banking system is sound as a whole doesn't mean that every bank is strong. We are seeing the correct statement that if you're a bank sensitive to both, and I want to stress both interest rate risk and credit risk, then you have a more difficult outlook. We will see good names 
getting short-term contagion. That was Mohammed Al Arian of the University of Cambridge, Queen's College president from New York City this morning. Good morning. Those comments, of course, ahead of the weekend, Sunday. A lot announced. We're going to go through it in detail for you throughout this morning. I just want to give you a flavour of the price action at the moment. Futures are just slightly negative, down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. So far, <clears throat> so good for equity futures. Elsewhere, though, these moves in Treasuries are just unreal. Down 14 basis points on a 10-year, 355. On a two-year, we're down about 32 basis points to 427. <clears throat> if you are just tuning in, late Sunday evening... The Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC said it will wind down a failed bank here in the United States in a way that, quote, fully protects all depositors. The hope being here that you back up all depositors and you don't get this deposit flight from other banks going to other places. And if you do, hopefully the banks can deal with that because the central bank also announced a new bank term funding program that offers one year loans to other banks in America under much, much easier terms. Now, last night, Tom, I think we're all having the same conversation. Have they done enough to prevent contagion and to really shore up the strength and resiliency of the financial system in America? And day by day, we're going to find out. But I think you mentioned this in the age of digital banking, Tom, in a world, and I know the process here that really Climax concluded with the failure of right. this bank has been developing over several years. But ultimately, things unwound pretty quickly in the space of 24, 48 hours. In a world where a bank can fail right. in 24, 48 hours, a week is a long time. Suddenly is a word we use in the literature, and the answer suddenly has changed. There were some really strong people out on Twitter, John, and I would suggest Jim Bianco absolutely nailed it in the mystery of Saturday morning with a long thread. And this is what he did, and this is what the great people do in law and economics, is they go to microeconomic dynamics. And Mr. Bianco talked about the frictions out there, and those frictions on radio, I'm rubbing my hands together, those frictions in the Twitter world are gone. In the cell phone world, Justin Smith, who worked here in digital and founded Bloomberg Digital, told me this. He said, Tom, cell phones are going to change everything with a vengeance. We saw that starting Friday in banking. Can we echo something we heard earlier this hour? Some really irresponsible tweets over the weekend. Oh, you're going to get me in trouble here. Really, Turn really to Bramo. irresponsible. Come on, Bramo, come in here and say Just me. highly irresponsible. Well, it's a psychology game. So if you start talking about bank runs and encouraging people to do things and predicting Armageddon, then you undermine uh, confidence, especially if you're in a position of, of having money. And there's a real question of what the motivation of some of these uh, financial I, leaders was to come out and basically sound the alarms. I am the, the son of two depression babies. And these are things you don't talk about. That's an American fabric. Let's do this right now. We're going to cut this for many different ways this morning. And this is, I'm sure for many of you, controversial. Robert Hockett is professor at Cornell Law School doing brilliant work with the wonderful Dan Alpert. And far more, Mr. Hockett has been an extremely intelligent voice of people outside of the capitalistic system uh, in America. His uh, service to progressive candidates in America, left candidates, is noted. Professor Hockett, thank you so for just so much for joining us uh, this morning. Is this a progressive opportunity? I thought 08 was a progressive opportunity. That didn't work out. Is this a time where progressives can pull capitalism a little bit towards the people of America? I think it is. I think it's a way that we can pull, a, a time that we can pull capitalism a little bit more toward a, a sort of a rational basis. I mean, if you start with the deposit insurance system, as you guys know, before the changes in the law made in 2005 and 2006, the deposit insurance fund was not actually funded by premiums paid in by the insured parties or the insured banks. Uh, and indeed, the assessments were made only when they essentially when the fund fell below a certain threshold, which was a pro-cyclical way of doing things rather than a counter-cyclical way, because, of course, generally the fund would be going down only when banks were actually in trouble across the board. They moved about 15, 20 years, almost 20 years ago, uh, to a system that is right. premium funded, which is great. The problem that we're living with right now is that the, the idea of caps on maximum amounts that can be insured is a sort of relic of the pre-risk pricing days, in other words, the pre-2005 days. But now, um, now that we actually are risk pricing it, there's no reason not to offer it to cover deposits in full right, to right. all banks. 
provided that they pay the right risk-adjusted premiums, right? So I think we can rational, we can move to a much more rational sort of deposit insurance system in that way. And that will be, I think, very much in keeping with the wishes of progressives on the one hand, but also I think with the wishes of pretty much right. everybody on the uh, other hand. Uh, uh, Robert, I want you to speak right now to a Republican group that represents a huge body of rural America with all that demographics. And I, I, I state the work of you and Dan Elpert on unemployment and labor in America is truly world class. I want you to speak to Republicans who think like you, but they can't do it visibly. How do they change their Republican Party, given they want representation of depositors in America? I think maybe the best way to kind of appeal to them is to note that we're really trying to begin a kind of productive resurgence in this country, right? We would like to make things again. We'd like to make America make again. And if you think about it, a bank like SVB is kind of almost perfectly situated to assist with that sort of endeavor. After all, all of the loans were to tech startup companies, essentially companies that might very well prove to be productive in the primary markets rather than the secondary and the tertiary markets. And all of the excess was invested in treasuries. Now, of course, it was a bit boneheaded for the management not to hedge against the interest rate risk that attaches no. to the kind of a portfolio. But in their defense, it's been 45 years since we've seen rates rise this quickly. And secondly, it's pretty easy to go ahead and hedge that risk going forward. But that still leaves in, in place the question of are we going to insure deposits in full of banks like this, given that many startup firms and newly productive firms need big operating budgets and they can't deal with a mere quarter million dollar bank account as their transaction account? Just quickly, Robert, just to build on what Tom and John were talking about, this is a new era of frictionless uh, withdrawals, and that changes the dynamic of bank runs. Does that also change the dynamic of the regulation, of the oversight, of the cost of how much some of these banks should have to pay to uh, insure their deposits? So I hate to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but I think what this does is render more urgent precisely what I'm advocating, right? The fact that we're now going to be more subject to liquidity risk because everything moves at the speed of Twitter or the speed of the iPhone messages, I think it's all the more important that we basically buttress the liquidity positions of all of our banks. And the way you do that is with deposit insurance. And again, if you price it rationally, then you're not actually imposing any new costs on the taxpayer or on the public at large. You're simply essentially offering a kind of insurance on a not-for-profit basis to all depositors and banks, irrespective of how large their accounts are. Professor, moral hazard is something that will come up repeatedly through this week. What would you say back to people that raise that particular word? Yeah. So uh, moral hazard, of course, afflicts all forms of insurance. And that's precisely why we determine what the premiums are on insurance accordingly, right? So one way you deal with the moral hazard is to charge rational premiums. Another way to do it, of course, is to impose safety and soundness regulations. These are kind of the equivalent of exclusions in ordinary private sector insurance policies. And that's, of course, what capital regulation, as administered by the, the FDIC, is, right? The F, and a lot of people don't know, perhaps, that the FDIC administers a capital regulatory regime on all banks, whether they be state chartered or nationally chartered. Ironically, one of the most important ways to keep sound and safe is to make sure that your asset portfolio doesn't have kind of crazy, risky, speculative assets. And treasuries are essentially the gold standard where that is concerned, right? So there's a great irony here in the sense that this was in some ways the boring bank uh, that people like Paul Krugman were calling for in 2008, investing merely in loans on the one hand, none of which were underperforming, it seems, by the way, and then the rest in treasuries, which which is just what the Fed does, right? In a certain sense, the non-loan portion of the portfolio of SVB just was the Fed portfolio. The Fed can, of course, afford um, yeah. <laughs> to deal with the uh, interest rate risk, especially since it's doing the, the rate rising. Private sector banks can't, they should have, but that doesn't really mean that the depositors shouldn't be protected against runs. Professor, thank you for your perspective this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Robert Hockett there of the Cornell Law School. Tom, a lot of people will have a lot to say about that conversation. I, I think they will. I mean, the, pol the politics of this is hugely, hugely uh, engaging. It can cut any in a way. I, I just go out to the simple question is, was this yield hog banking? Did they just decide they wanted to find yield and profit through coupon versus do the responsible thing? Lisa, you tell me, two-year two -year maturity, five-year maturity, and not out past that, and they went out past that. We'll have to see what the uh, regulations, what the insurance looks like. That's my question. There's a lot of people who are going to say the same thing this morning. These banks that haven't failed didn't manage their interest rate risk properly. 
and the Federal Reserve has just given them a big, big way out of that. Futures right now, just about positive. Clearly, the banking system is telling us that there's some kind of issue here. And I would say, Lisa, that money has been shut down. The banking system, for the first time, really, is dealing with negative deposit growth year over year. We don't see this as a systemic crisis, nothing compared to 08, 09, or 1990. I cannot believe that what's happening in the banking sector will not give the Fed pause in this market. This is almost like the opposite of the global financial crisis. And now the fears are way out there when the banks are more resilient than they've been in a generation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. The market fallout from the biggest bank failure in the United States of America since 2008. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. With equity futures just about positive by four-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. The Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, all together Sunday evening announcing <coughs> it will wind down the failed bank here in the United States, Silicon Valley Bank, in a way that, quote, Tom, fully protects all depositors have they done enough? Is it a bailout? That's a raging debate this morning. We've been covering that in our first hour here of Bloomberg Surveillance, and it will continue uh, forward. I'm less concerned, John, about the bailout dynamics, but about what's different on a Monday, which is we have market data, and the market data was to be collegial green on the screen, then not because of Europe and select American banks. And just in the last 10 minutes, we get a little bit of that 3 a.m. oomph back, which is a constructive sign. Let's pick up on that tension at the front end of the yield curve in the United States of America and elsewhere too. Two-year yields in America down 27 basis points, 431. So that's more than 70 basis points lower than they were from Wednesday. That's the bond market. Lisa, Tom mentioned some single names. Some of those single names, those bank stocks in America in the pre-market, down more than 60%. Yeah, First Republic Bank. I'm looking at PacWest shares. Those shares down about 34 percent. I did not know trading. that, really. PacWest is down 34 Yeah, there's, wow. there's others that are also down, but not quite to that same degree. You're seeing some sort of potential fallout in the expectation of what other banks could lose customer assets out of fear and in a knee-jerk reaction at a time when they can do that from their phones, when they can do that <laughs> from their computers, triggering a much faster virtual run on the bank that creates uh, potentially more issues. We keep going back to a very simple question that a lot of people in this country ask themselves over the weekend. Tom, where do we bank? And is that bank big enough? Heart of the matter. And do we need to open a new Heart account this week? Well, oh, new new account and also multiple accounts. I think the whole 250,000 statistic has been shattered. It was shattered in 2008. We'll address that theme. Thomas Shota, Keith Briette joining us is definitive on this. But, John, I, I, I really think everyone's resetting, and it's not just a simple one iPhone move. It's multiple decisions. And these were clearly quick decisions over the weekend, quick decisions to try and stem the fallout from Silicon Valley Bank <clears> and other names as well. But the regulatory fallout, Lisa, the consequences, the follow through, the snapback even, some of the things that were unwound five years ago, that's where the conversation is going to be in the few few weeks ahead of us, the next few months as well. Some people were saying, are we back to quantitative easing, right? And then all of a sudden you have a pricing in of no rate hikes or just one more and then rate cuts later this year. The policy response being save the financial system at all costs and then what's the moral hazard? And that's going to be discussed for a very long time. There's also a larger question of the interconnectedness of venture capital of some of these banks who grew by so quickly and then didn't know what to do. The duration, the fact that the risk is in the safest assets, right? The duration risk that has come to the fore. All of these <clears> questions has <throat> raised some more concerns about what's I, the next shoe to drop in a significant way. I, I, math doesn't work here this morning. There's so much emotion going on. But I did a lot of fancy math. And the answer is, in on that Thursday in August of 07, John, LIBOR OIS was a four standard deviation move, and that was considered outrageous. The move of a 10-year bond in recent months has been over five standard deviations, and that was the shock they had to quote-unquote manage. So the Federal Reserve is in a quiet period now. No Fed speak on the calendar whatsoever. We have CPI coming up tomorrow. We have retail sales after that. The final piece of Fed speak in the Financial Times with Colby Smith, Tom, the final piece of it <clears throat> was after the session on Friday with the Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, who refused to rule out a 50 basis point move, said he was open to it, wouldn't rule anything out. So we're still talking about rate hikes from the Fed speakers of last week. Now, 
I think a lot of people have woken up this morning and come to the conclusion that everything's changed. Oh. We won't get a move. We're in the Jan Hatzius camp over at Goldman. I would say we've still got some data this week, some important information still to come. I am personally, I'm in the camp that there's still value to the Tuesday. It's Tuesday, right? CPI Tomorrow. inflation uh, data. There's others. Uh, Sarah Vellis at Deutsche Bank just pushes it uh, aside. But I will say, uh, God, John, you get me in so much. I can't stand you. The, the, the Newtonian vector of the 10 years, it's not funny, Lisa, the Newtonian vector Translate of the Fed funds too. rate was irresponsible. It was not what they did. It was the speed, the x-axis that they did it, totally unprecedented. And in, in, I'm sorry, very non-Greenspan. So I think the, the anniversary of the first hike is on the 16th, I believe, which is Thursday. Zero to close to 5% in 12 months. And you're saying, you're saying that's a mistake? I, I don't know. The, the phrase that they use is slew rates is one example of this from engineering. The bottom line, and this is simple, they move too fast. That's it. The magnitude of getting from here to there, I've talked like a main guy, sure. you get to, well, Cassidy's coming on, it works. From here to there, that's fine. But in hindsight, and some were suggesting along the way, it just took too long. That's the issue. They move so fast because they, they move, move so, so slow. Fast. Yeah. Th that's ultimately yeah, the they problem. They had to play catch up. And, and to the silence of the Fed, maybe they break the rule today. Maybe we should hear from Chairman Powell today. You know, I'm, I'm, you know. We'll see. We'll see. Let's get to Ashok <coughs> Bhatia, the Deputy CIO of Fixed Income over at Newburger Berman. Ashok, I just want to start with this move in the Treasury market. There's so much to discuss with you. What do you make of this move over the last three days on a two year yield, just aggressively lower? <coughs> Well, the market, as you guys were talking about, I mean, it's taken out, uh, you know, any chance of them going 50, uh, you know, in the next meeting. We're down to now we're kind of debating and we're pricing zero versus 25. And I, I think that's very, very rational at this point. Um, I think the Fed, you know, they got a, a relatively weak wage number on payrolls. And I think they're probably hoping they're going to get a, a 0 0.2 CPI. And then they have the economic data to, to, to justify this. But I do think the Fed is going to be looking at this as this is a quasi-permanent tightening of financial conditions. This is unlike the tightening of financial conditions they've been generating the last year or so, where it's been more stock market driven, dollar driven, you know, tradable financial market variables, and is going to be something that is going to impact the real economy. Extent is unknown. So I think they will have more comfort in the idea that the economy is going to slow and that they can slow uh, the pace of hikes pretty quickly. How much does that completely reset Asia? what you were expecting and the way that you've arranged your portfolio at a time of very high volatility. Well, we'd been thinking that the, this, the, the, the peak of Fed hiking was in sight. Now, that was more driven by a view that inflation was going to be coming off and start coming off pretty quickly than the idea that we were going to have a, a, a 48 or 36 hour banking crisis. So I think the idea is that you know the market is is trading in the in the bond market right now of a little bit of more pressure in credit spreads of steeper yield curves of range bound rates. Um, I think kind of we've gotten to the end point for a different reason for how this was likely to play out. I think from here, you know, we obviously have the banking issues. I think you know the credit markets are are you know widening in credit spreads. Uh, we're not going to see what we've seen a lot of the last two years where spreads can have a very quick snapback from these widening events. We're likely, you know, resetting to a little bit of a higher higher income and spread level. And I would expect the Treasury market to, to you know, to, to be, uh, you know, bought, not sold on any dips here. Would you have to expect a higher rate of defaults as a result, corporate defaults, because of this question around the access of capital, around investing in a company that could be more intimately tied to what we're seeing right now? Well, I, I don't want to be super negative here because corporate America um, is in pretty good shape as, as, a, as a statement. Now, we're coming from an environment of 1.6 or so default rates, maybe 2% default rates in, in high yield markets globally. So we're starting from a very low point. So part of it is, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot harder to, to, to get lower from, from that. But I do think this rate shock, which we've now seen in a, in a bank and a, a levered financial institution, 
our expectation is that this rate shock, you know, over the coming quarters, there are going to be some impacts into, right. into the real economy and corporate America. Ashok, with the independence of Newberger Berman, I can ask this with great respect because Newberger Berman folks lived the Lehman moment. They were private. They were August. Mr. Uh, Newberger built this out uh, for years, and then they were taken out by Lehman in 03, 04 ish and blew up in 08. Ashok, your, your team lived this. There's no other way uh, to put it. Should we fear the big banks if we are going to get new bank concentration? Is that something unfair to Americans? Well, there are so many questions wrapped up in that. Um, I, I would say first, the U.S. needs like small banks, regional banks. I mean, the, the market's focus is on the regional banks, but we've got a lo lot of in, in our country doing local bank lending <laughs> against real estate and small business. That's important. Now, the, the challenge is they're not under the same regulatory framework that the big banks are. But I do think, you know, this, this is a lot different than 08. 08 was about bank collateral that was either not not you know not worth anything or um, a lot of opacity around where it should be valued you know by and large our expect expectation of you is that bank loan books are not in terrible shape they're in pretty good shape this is now this is more of a psychology and a deposit flight issue it's more of a traditional bank run type of issue than it is a solvency issue that was what really defined a lot of the 08 crisis. And in some ways, that makes it a little bit easier to solve. But it is also more in the what you were all talking about, the psychology of how capital is moving right now. It's just amazing. Some things don't change. Just an old fashioned bank run <laughs> taking down an institution. Ashok Batia there of Newberger uh, Berman. Ashok, thank you. Morgan Stanley, Mike Wilson, just published in moments ago. Saw that. Yeah. The headline, long and variable lags are here. The quote. This past week, witnessed the sudden collapse of SVB. The real story for equity markets is the impact of the Fed's actions over the past year. Tom, to your point, earnings growth expectations remain materially too high. Markets are now likely to price that risk more quickly. Is the Fed backing away good news when the Fed's backing away for the wrong reasons? It's the way they do it. That's absolutely right. They're going to do it for the wrong reasons and that they, that they got this wrong and they're going to verbal this. I don't think the usual Fed speak to her is going to get it done. This is where the chairman has to come out with clarity and state the new vision. That's a real challenge ahead for Chairman Powell. It's a single issue morning. I know that. But there is some news coming <clears throat> in beneath the radar that I need to stay on top of. This from the Wall Street Journal just moments ago. China's leader Xi to speak with Zelensky and meet next week with Putin. So going to speak with Zelensky, meeting with Putin, which we, well, which we knew already. And this time, this comes at a time when last week, Hardly the, talked the Middle about. East hardly talked about. Brokering a deal yeah. between Iran and Saudi. I'm really glad you bring this up. The news flow is extraordinary, folks. We'll try to piece it in here in our financial calamity. The futures on the S&P up a half of 1%. Big, big rally in the bond market. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Bloomberg has learned Russian President Vladimir Putin plans to meet top business leaders in the Kremlin this week for the first time since he launched the invasion of Ukraine. The March 16th gathering with the top members of the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs comes as a government which is struggling to cover rising spending as the war enters its second year, steps up pressure on companies to pay more in taxes. Reuters is reporting Chinese President Xi Jinping plans to travel to Moscow to meet Putin as soon as next week. China's foreign ministry did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Meanwhile, Xi Jinping has started an unprecedented third term as China's president with fresh vows to ensure stability and strength in party leadership. In his speech closing out the annual National People's Congress, he vowed to oppose foreign interference in Taiwan, a veiled reference to increasing American support for the government in Taipei. And German airline passengers are facing severe disruption today with commercial departures canceled at Berlin's biggest airport. Hanover and Bremen will also be affected by walkouts as ground staff strike amid a drown-out pay dispute. Now, the planned industrial action comes less than a month after Lufthansa scrapped at least 1,200 flights due to strikes at its hubs in Frankfurt and Munich. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
almost all of our bank failures during the great financial crisis. We had about 400 of them. We did purchase an assumption. We sold a, a failed bank to a healthy bank. And usually the healthy acquirer would also cover the uninsured because they wanted the franchise value of those large depositors. So optimally, that's the best outcome. The problem is this was a rush. This was a liquidity failure. It was right. a bank run. So they didn't have time to prepare to market the bank. So they're having to do that now and playing catch up. It all came together very quickly. That was the brilliant Sheila Bear there, the former chair of the FDIC on NBC over the weekend from New York City this morning. Good morning. Here's a flavor of the price action right now. Equity futures on the S&P 500 <coughs> positive by a half of 1%. The move in the bond market just absolutely phenomenal. Your 10-year yield down 10, 11 basis points, 359. Your two-year yield, just this move here, 26 basis points lower, 432. We had a break of that a little bit earlier on this morning much much lower than that actually we've come down from north of five percent tom to 430 in two and a bit trading days yeah. in america just unbelievable off the radar brent crude 8171 for brent crude to break 8080 would be a huge deal we're not seeing that yet but there are some correlations out there amid uh, the trauma i want to suggest john having sheila bear and meet the press on sunday was absolutely brilliant i spoke to her it seemed like we spoke about every two weeks it was less than that but that's the way it was in the crisis this is someone an academic out of umass amherst she was a bob dole acolyte out of kansas and she found foundationally understands small banking in America. She lived with Bob Dole the early part of the SNL crisis. Should we get to the deposit insurance, Tom? Is <clears> 250 <throat> a limit anymore? Is that done? No, is that over with? It well, just feels like that was my amateur over the take weekend. is it's done and it should have been higher uh, to begin with. I thought it was artificial. I mean, just, just depends what the price is going to be for that insurance, right? How do you determine that? If it's not 250, is it free insurance as and, much as you want in terms of whatever do you have in terms of your uh, deposit account? And the arch issue here to get to our next guest is have we done the data check, John? You think we're okay here? Briefly, the yeah. I mean, there's tons to talk about. I could come back to it yeah, later. We'll come back to it later. And, and what is so important here is what was so different in the time of Bob. Dole money market funds. Gerard Cassidy joins us now, as he did on Friday, I believe it was. He is with RBC Capital Markets and absolutely definitive on the fabric of American banking. Is that all this is about, Gerard? The Reserve Bank, you and I one day were sitting over a cup of coffee at that little coffee shop by Government Center in Boston, and we said, what the hell is a mar money market fund? Now we know. Is that all this is about, is the fear of bank deposits moving to money market funds? Tom, thank you for having me on the program again. And I think that's definitely part of it. And you have a very good memory because when the reserve, reserve Fund broke the buck, the Fed immediately came out and guaranteed all of the money market <coughs> mutual funds to instill confidence in the money market mutual fund industry back then. Today, of course, because of what's happened with Silicon Valley Bank, and then yesterday, of course, Signature Bank, there's not a lot of confidence by uh, depositors to keep the large depositors over the deposit limit to keep their deposits in the bank. However, the action that was announced yesterday by the Fed, the U.S. Treasury, and the FDIC should give all depositors confidence that their deposits are insured well above the $250,000 limit that you guys addressed. So I think it's going to take some time to, to cool down. There's certainly a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. It's showing up in the bank stocks at the opening. So it will be a really uh, bumpy, rough day today for bank equities. It's not helping the bank stocks to the pre-market. And I think that's what stands out for a lot of people, Gerard. Do you think what they've done overnight, yesterday evening, is sufficient to prevent the deposit flight from small, medium-sized banks in America to the SIBs? I think it is, uh, John, but it, it takes time for the message to get out there. All of us, obviously, are very zeroed in on this. We do it for a living. We look, eat and, and drink this stuff every single day, uh, but the regular folk, n not so much. So as a result, I think the messaging has to get out there stronger to reassure everybody. And the community banks have to obviously reach out or the smaller regional banks reach out to their customers and point out that they're very well capitalized. The, the banks are profitable. This is not a credit problem, as you guys know. This is a problem with the bond portfolios being upside down. And John, I liked your comments about what the 10-year government bond yield is doing today. That shrinks any unrealized losses because of the strength uh, in the bond market. So, Jared, the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, as you know, but for those people just tuning in who haven't been maybe following this as closely, have wind down these institutions. They're looking to do that and, quote, fully protect all depositors. Jared, we're trying to work out the profit challenge here. 
the net interest margin story, how much the small banks will have to pay up for those deposits, how much they'll have to raise interest rates, where it leaves the major lenders. Over the weekend, I was thinking about this, Jared. If I'm a major bank right now, B of A, JP Morgan, I was expecting deposits just to line up at the door, no matter what the interest rate was on them. We'll just open accounts for you and we'll give you zero. You know it's safe here. How is that going to change in the coming weeks? John, you, you, you're you you bringing up a very good point with the larger banks. If depositors are moving to them for safety, the concern about deposit betas going up for the biggest banks may actually go into reverse because, as you said, they don't need to maybe pay interest if somebody's moving there into for safety. But you're right. On the smaller banks, they may be required to pay up for deposits um, due to the fact that there's this uncertainty. And again, it's obviously a very volatile time today and probably for the next couple of days. But we do expect this to calm down. Um, and I think you know the Fed and the FDIC and Treasury came out very clearly yesterday saying that deposits you know, over 250 at those two banks that failed will be fully insured. And that implication to me is that all bank deposits now are insured un to an unlimited amount for the time being. And Gerard, I think a lot of people would share that. You talked about how you do expect this to calm down. In the process, though, there could be uh, some significant bumps along the way. I'm looking right now at Credit Suisse. Yeah. Default swaps hitting a record. Those shares falling to a record low as people probably imagine the fallout hitting some of the weaker players. How many more casualties do you see now than, say, on Friday, as you see the reaction with respect to depositors, with respect to reg regulators not being able to stave off some of the concern in markets? It's a good question because, you know, what they came out with, uh, the firepower on deposits, is quite strong. And so some of the stocks that are down the most today have plenty of access to now the Fed's uh, lines as they announced yesterday, we also have to remember that they have federal home loan bank advances that they could tap. And that was part of the reason what happened last week with Silicon Valley was the speed in which it happened. I mean, it's amazing. At 3.59 p.m. on Wednesday, everything was OK. And by early Friday morning, that bank was out of business. We've never seen anything that fast in our careers. And so now these other companies have time to tap lines. Now they have the new lines, and that should really stave off the fear that, or, or handle any uh, deposit disruption, deposit run that they may feel today and tomorrow. They have access to plenty of money to be able to handle those uh, withdrawals. Jared, listening to the, the word bailout over the weekend, it seems to be so emotionally charged that no one really wants to go there. But, Jared, I just wonder, from your perspective, what you've just mentioned, this new bank term funding program the Fed's offering, allowing that collateral basically to come in at par, when some of these treasuries are deep, 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 deep underwater. They've mismanaged interest rate risk, Jared. We talked about that now over the last week. How much of a lifeline is that for those poorly managed institutions? I, John, you're right. You know, the securities are going to be pledged at par. Um, they're going to have this program run, as the Fed said yesterday, at least until March of next year. So I think if they still need uh, um, some assistance, we would I would anticipate the program extended into 24 if it needs to be. So it's really going to come down to a matter of building up equity, the banks <laughs> over the next 12 months, and then possibly selling some of these underwater securities, taking losses that they can handle, and then moving uh, through this problem. Time will solve this problem. And with this now program, I, I think you're going to find that the banks are now being given uh, time to solve this problem by growing earnings through normal banking operations and possibly over time taking some of those unrealized losses to losses and then eliminate the problem completely. Joe Cassidy, thank you, sir, from RBC Capital Markets on this financial situation. Tom, you nailed it. TK, we talked about this earlier, and you said that funding program, that facility from the Federal Reserve, you expected to be extended to. Yeah, I, I thought of Carl Weinberg a lot this week, and he wrote a brilliant note for High Frequency Economics this morning. He's someone expert in what do you do with Greece? What do you do with Ecuador? Gerard Cassidy knows six banks that are in Ecuador this morning that we're not even talking about. He, he's literally that encyclopedic. And the answer is, you put up cash, you extend time, almost extend and pretend, and you set up a gift of an interest rate while you catch up to it down the road. It's no different than a debt workout of Ecuador. I don't mean to pick on Ecuador. No, I'm, I'm with you. It's one heck of an yeah. announcement from the Federal Reserve yesterday evening. <clears throat> CDS on Credit Suisse. Lisa mentioned that the equity is down 10, 11 percent. This is Bloomberg.
It's like the market never really closed on Friday, <clears throat> Saturday, Sunday, just waiting for that news from authorities here in the United States. Let's get to the price action for you briefly on the equity market on the S&P 500. Positive a little more than a tenth of 1%. A snapback on the Nasdaq, positive eight tenths of 1%. A heavy weighting towards the financials on a Russell. Be wary of that. We're down about a half of 1% on Russell futures. But here's the why for the Nasdaq, I guess. We can talk about this later. Look at this move in the bond market, twos, tens, thirties. Your two-year yield, aggressively lower, <clears throat> down by 34, 35 basis points, 423, 43. That move is from a level of north of 5%, north of 5% from Wednesday. Chair Powell, day two, a testimony. I just wonder if Chairman Powell <clears throat> had his, his second go, his third go, his fourth go at testimony this morning, how different that testimony might be. Goldman Sachs oh, out maybe, earlier. Maybe Tom, do. Jan Hatz, you're saying no hike. No hike well, this month and no clue what happens after that. I mean, it's a parlor game, and I guess it plays off 8.30 tomorrow morning, 25 hours from now. Do we do an inflation show or do we do a banking show? And my guess is we're still going to be doing a banking show with a little bit of an event that's perhaps bigger than Jobs Day was on Friday, if you remember that. For the first time in 12 months, yeah. this Fed will not have a singular focus on inflation. There'll be something <clears throat> else. Oh. To think about. No, on a, on a, on a, on a constitutional is the wrong word, but on a foundational basis back to 1913 in the Federal Reserve Act, this completely overwhelms monetary policy. Does it change things for the ECB in quite the same way? Look at this move on a German two year this yeah. morning. We are lower by 37 basis points at the front end of the German curve on a I... week where people expect the ECB to go 50. Now, I guess the question is, it's not the 50 this week. We'll see if they go 50. I, I would pontificate. It's, it's the what yeah. next, what's, what's coming later. You're the expert on this. I'd pontificate that this fiercely upgrades the Netherlands, Germany, Austria view at the ECB. Fiercely. I would say the wrinkle yeah. here at the Governing Council meeting coming up <clears throat> this week it's not about the 50 basis point move they've basically pre-committed to, and we'll see if they follow through on it. The conversation would have been, do we need to pre-commit to a 50 basis point move after this one? And given the uncertainty in the financial sector over the week, Elisa, given what's developing at the moment, I think anyone's going to be very cautious to pre-commit to anything. Remember before we had the banking crisis, we were looking at uh, this huge divergence of people who thought that there was disinflation and those who thought that we had uh, potentially new peaks in inflation ahead. Where has that discussion gone? Do people think that inflation is no longer a problem and there's been enough of a natural tightening in financial conditions to eliminate the risk of inflation to the same degree? I think that's a real question. That would be good news. I think at the moment the bad news is we have real policy conflict on our hands. Correct. If we'd solved the inflation right. issue and they were sufficiently satisfied with developments and said, OK, far enough, we're seeing things break, I'm not sure that's the case at all at the moment, Tom. I think there's still a worry on this FOMC, on the right. ECB, Governing Council, that they haven't done enough. Inflation is still too elevated and this financial stability concern has, has surfaced at the uh, Well, that's the, the battle. Wrong time. Everybody's got an opinion. I would suggest our opinion is to wait for the President of the United States and I assume we'll get follow-on from Secretary Yellen and maybe we get an unusual statement from Chairman Powell. I do think that this is going to be the key question, this policy conflict and how it gets resolved uh, and how they signal that. I just do want to take a look at some of the banks uh, that are getting the most affected ahead of the open. On the smaller to regional size banks, we talked about First Republic, those shares down more than 60 percent, wow. at one point down more than 70 percent this morning ahead of the open. Western Alliance down 47 percent, uh, 49, 50. I mean, you could just see the losses building as we move forward. Uh, PacWest, Bancorp, those shares down more than 30 percent. And I include Bank of America because the big banks have really been isolated from some of these moves, right? You're seeing basically flat in pre-market trading for the likes of J.P. Morgan. <clears throat> Bank of America has been hit harder than the others. And I wonder, to your point, John, how this makes sense. You made a great point about if people are worried about putting their money in some of these smaller to regional banks, don't the big banks win? Don't they basically don't have to pay anything oh, for deposits yeah. because they're safe? Well, then, What's the that argument the for some battle. of these banks? Is yeah. this a deposit issue where they've got to pay up for it? Is it a profitability issue? Is it the potential exposure in the hold to maturity uh, buckets for some of these banks? Well, authorities have basically come out in the last 24 hours and said all deposits are insured. <laughs> Correct. Based on the failure of these banks over the weekend, which begs the question. I mean, we're asking this morning, have they done enough? <laughs> have they done enough to basically tell everyone who was asking the question over the weekend, do we need to move bank accounts? The answer this morning for the regulator, for officials, should be no. no. Should be no. So begs the question, why are we seeing 
what we're seeing right now. The other issue, the Federal Reserve has opened up a new funding facility for banks to say, yes, I know you've got these securities that are deep, deep, deep underwater, but guess what? You can post that collateral with us at par and we'll give you this cheap funding. That's going to be great for you. So you should be able to stem the tide as well. Have they done enough? Let's see where we are at the end of the day. I've got absolutely no idea. But I think some people are surprised by the magnitude of the move in these single names, given what was announced yesterday evening. I would agree. I think that people <clears throat> think if the government is backstopping these deposits, shouldn't there be some sort of relief in markets that we're not seeing. I will argue we are seeing the systemic interconnectedness in a way that is new for this cycle. And I think about, for example, a stable coin that broke the buck because its assets were parked at Silicon Valley uh, Bank. I mean, this sounds esoteric, but it's not. It highlights sort of the connected tissues of a market that had been inflated by a decade of low rates. Michael Schill joins us right now. He's the chief executive officer of Market Field Asset Management and far more incredibly astute out of, I believe, Manchester, the University of Manchester United uh, in accounting and technology. <laughs> and he joins us uh, this morning. Not a day to talk football. We'll say that no, for no. another day. I'm going to be delicate here. We all learned in our school that one of the great things that provides liquidity within our system are people without hysterics looking long to buy something with enthusiasm and some time to establish a trade of looking for the price to go down in shorts. Market field is acclaimed for shorting banks. I don't want to get into individual security specifics, but do you sustain shorts today in banks you know about that we don't know about, or do you just step aside in crisis? No, I, I mean, I think a lot of it has happened. I mean, if we talk about the regionals and why they're down today, I think it's because they've lost deposits. And although maybe deposit flight slows down thanks to this program, <laughs> right. a lot of that money simply isn't going to go back. So um, they, you know, and they've damaged their profitability. But I think, you know, once you're down 70, 80 percent right. from where you were last Wednesday, right. Uh, you know, a lot of that's happened. But the question now is, what are the knock-on effects? If we assume the sort of bullish scenario, which is the regulators and the Fed are able to clean up this in the short term, I think looking ahead, what we have is radically tighter lending standards in venture capital and commercial real estate. And so now I think you look out three, six, nine months and you say, you know, who could potentially be damaged? Mm -hmm. And again, you always look back to who really took advantage of ultra low rates and who really had a fantastic 18, 24 months between the end of COVID and the end of 2021. You know, I mean, our, our, our concerns would be centered around private credit, private equity. You know, that, that if, mm -hmm. if there's a secondary crisis down the road in, well, the, in the same way as Bear Stearns led to Lehman, that's kind of where we would be looking. And, and that speaks to the shadows of the moment. We've heard from many other guests that the shadows out there now is this huge a la Silicon Valley. John, you mentioned this earlier, this just magnitude of money that floated into these uh, people. Who do we blame for, to use a sophisticated word, the ginormous move of money that we see. Is it the Biden stimulus? Uh, yes, and, and the Trump stimulus before that. I mean, I think pretty much everything that happened after May, 80 percent of what happened after May 2020 was a mistake. You know, we, we had a real crisis in May, in May 2020, and thank God they stepped in and did something really radical. And, you know, the second and third waves of PPP being indiscriminate was a mistake. Sending checks to everybody was a mistake taking interest rates to where they were and then keeping them for that long. It was all a mistake. Yeah. And we, we talked about it in real time. And uh, unfortunately, this, this now looks like one of these classic moves from ultra easy monetary and fiscal policy into, into something much tighter. Um, and I, I would say, you know, the Fed for the time being isn't really what we should be focused on. I, I don't really care if they go 25 or 50 basis points or nothing on, on Wednesday. The market will care in the short term. What I'm concerned about is whether we are entering a period of much, much, much tighter lending standards, because that's what will affect the underlying economy if what, that happens. What gives you the impression that we will? Well, you've taken out a bunch of the most aggressive lenders, the regional banks which survive. I mean, the lesson from this last week is the shareholders and the bondholders lost everything. OK, depositors are OK, but if you're running a bank and you're looking at your own personal wealth and, and your shareholders' wealth and your bondholders are going to be screaming at you, don't you dare turn me into Silicon Valley, you're going to have to run a much, much more conservative bank. Plus, you've lost a ton of your deposits. And the deposits have flown into these very large banks that aren't simply going to be as aggressive, at, you know, at the margin. So 
you know, the, the, the advice I would give people in, in the sort of business world is I would be securing lines of credit from high quality banks right now before you need them, because when you need them, they may not be available. So you've got to make a market call with that as your framework. What is it? Um, you know, I think we'll, we'll clean up this mess and rally. And then it will become apparent later this year that we've got a real problem coming. That, 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 that's my guess. And, you know, in the meantime, I think certain assets do OK. I, I think this is a big win for precious metals again. And, uh, do you think this is a win for big tech that used to be interest rate sensitive? No. Um, I think the reason why the Nasdaq does so well now is it doesn't have any banks in it, uh, the Nasdaq 100. And everyone forgets that. It did OK in 08 till Lehman because it had no banks in it. No, this is, this, look, this is helpful at the margins, right? I mean, interest rates don't go as high as we thought. It helps for NASDAQ. But there's nothing really very positive here for technology earnings going forwards. I mean, the big spenders of the banks. You said it's good for precious metals. Yes. Are you saying that we're going to face higher inflation? No, even I'm with saying that, financial that, conditions? there's an awful lot of money now which has been forced to do something. And when things calm down and people are, OK, what could I be doing with that money? Um, you know, I, I don't think the dollar ends up, you know, if the dollar's... Recent strength seems to have ended. Um, I think crypto has a lot of like <laughs> a lot of shadows, a lot of shadows over it, and and gold uh, kind of stands out. Thomas Schott is coming up after you. Mm -hmm. He's venerable in small banking. Keith Bretton Woods is the backbone of their their yeah. business. When they do lines of credit with larger banks, are they nothing more than a proxy for J.P. Morgan or Bank of America? Are we deluding ourselves as a nation? if they've got to get lines of credit from large money center banks? Yeah, I look, I think it's a, a sucky situation. I mean, this, is, this isn't where you want to be. That's CFA, just um, in case you need it. It's not yeah. British. <laughs> exactly. It's, 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 it, this is not where you want to be. Never but this, is, this is the point we were trying to make uh, 18 months ago, which is that as great as this boom felt and as fantastic as everything was, it doesn't lead to good outcomes. Michael, you're just excellent. Thank this you. was really thoughtful stuff. Thank you. Michael Shah there of Market Field Asset Management. Coming up on this program, Tom just mentioned it. Thomas Shaw, the CEO of KBW. That conversation's coming up next. Futures right now on the S&P 500, just about unchanged. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Norway, NATO forces are gathered for joint drills as the Defense Alliance, along with Russia, China and others, compete for greater control of the Arctic. Estimates suggest the region holds around one fourth of the globe's oil and natural gas resources. Meanwhile, Ukraine's interior minister says Russian missiles and artillery have destroyed more than 152,000 residential buildings since the start of the invasion. In his first public comment since taking office, Premier Li Zhang says China will protect the rights of entrepreneurs and continue to support private businesses. He also downplayed the importance of Beijing's modest economic growth target of around 5 percent, saying citizens are more focused on issues that affect their daily lives rather than the pace of gross domestic product. U.S., Australia and U.K. leaders will announce plans for a new fleet of nuclear-powered submarines as they deepen the AUKUS defense partnership aimed at countering China in the Pacific. Upgrading Australia's aging subfleet is a linchpin that in that, effort, in that effort. Now, President Biden will meet in San Diego today with U.K. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to unveil plans to develop the new submarine. And a film made for less than $20 million was the big winner at the Oscars, picking up Best Picture and six other trophies. Everything Everywhere All at Once by independent studio A24 won out over some of the highest grossing pictures in Hollywood history. Avatar The Way of Water and Top Gun Maverick, which between them have taken close to $4 billion at the box office, scored just one Oscar apiece. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I mean, it almost feels like we're back in 2007, 2008, uh, when we have a major bank or even a substantial player. Silicon Valley Bank uh, should not have got to the point and regulators should not have allowed it to get to the point where there is essentially a run on the bank and the FDIC has to take over. And, uh, you know, California regulators are shutting it down. And this smells bad. 
From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Coming off the back of the worst week in the equity market for the year so far. Futures trying to bounce and not doing it very successfully. Futures right now are down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Your bond market looks like this. Your 10-year yields lower on a 10-year now by 19 basis points. Look at this move on a two-year. Can we get the two-year up, guys? Your two-year yield is down 46, <coughs> almost 47 basis points lower to 4.12%. And I'll keep going back to what I said repeatedly earlier this morning. Wednesday, intraday, 5.08%. We have had almost a 100 basis yeah. point move in just a couple of sessions and change. I don't have a moving average study, John, on Credit Suisse, but I'm going to make clear in the last hour it's been a series of lower highs and lower lows. On a moving average basis, I'm eyeballing that Credit Suisse trading in Swiss francs is at lows for the day on a moving average basis. Down 12%. Yeah. Tom, when you see the curve bull steepen in the way it is right now, as aggressively uh, as it is right now, that doesn't usually tell a nice bedtime story to help us all sleep at night. Somebody's on the back side of that tray, but I'd also take it in further, John, from the conventional two-year statistic to three months. And we're now, as we were in 07, with studies of three-month dynamics to two months. I don't pretend to be adult on that. In the old days, it was LIBOR OIS. Ira Jersey says there's some new alphabet soup. I'm not sure what Lisa's dying to get in here, the Bramo cam. The sofa? Yeah. No, no. Sofa. Uh, yeah. I, I, the just, Oprah? I know, it's sofa. Uh, you raise a good point, though, about a bull steepener. This question of are we looking at Fed rate cuts in the face of something very dramatic in yeah. the next couple of, uh, of years? 50 basis point move. Amazing. 4.08% on a two year. That is 100 basis points lower right. from just Wednesday. From just <clears> Wednesday, Tom. Monster move. It was Friday, early morning Sunday, as we worked through the weekend. I said, get Michaud. Um, he is with KBW, who have been attached to small banking and securities analysis of banking through my entire career. Thomas Michaud is CEO of KBW, a Stiefel company. We're thrilled he could join us from California uh, this morning. Uh, Tom, I don't know where to begin with eight themes, but to cut to the chase, you've lived this. What should Jerome Powell do in the coming hours and days? I, I think this is still a moment about confidence. Uh, it's confidence for depositors to know that the money in their bank is safe. Uh, it's also confidence among investors. Uh, you've got uh, an S&P 500 company whose stock just went to zero pretty quickly. Um, and so investors want to know uh, that the confident want to have confidence in the mm -hmm. system as well, and and so we need orderliness, uh, and that's what I think uh, is necessary at the moment. And uh, right. the agencies took action last night, and we're going to find out if it's enough, enough or if more is needed. Tom, very simply here, my theme for the year, not seeing any of this coming, is the great zombie roll-up. Keith Briad and Woods is expert at gauging the zombies out there among thousands of banks. How troubled is our banking system? How many zombies are out there for a 2023 great zombie roll-up? So I'll tell you, the, the, the bank that fell last week, Silicon Valley, um, on, on all the measures, was probably one of the biggest risk takers in terms of interest rates with their bond portfolio. They were an outlier. Uh, uh, my uh, conversations with many bank CEOs is that the uh, deposit outflow contagion had not spread throughout the industry. Uh, however, I know that concern was raising and rising. And you could see, I think, if this continues, you could see it to start to affect banks that had very prudently managed themselves. And, and that's what happens when consumer behavior or commercial behavior for deposits changes quickly. That's why I think we need a government support mechanism to make things orderly. We got some of that last night. If it's not enough, I think they got to do, they should do more. Um, uh, but you know, what's really interesting, Tom, is this is all about the unwinding of COVID relief. There are two things that happened that dramatically impacted the banking industry. One is we've had rate increases at the fastest pace of my career. It's been fast and it's been significant in terms of its measure. Number two is that the system during COVID was flooded, the banking system with deposits. There's a purposeful effort right now to drain liquidity and drain those deposits. 
it's happening at a pace that I don't think any management team in banking has ever seen before. So while that's happening, you have a crisis of confidence, which is compounding the issue. And that's why I think we need this broader support. If I were to show you the, the market, the metrics of a typical bank, they're actually outstanding. Credit quality is, is, is of no concern at the moment. You've got, uh, you've got companies that have stable capital, but they weren't necessarily built to have this type of stress put on deposits overnight. And that's why I think we need a calming influence. Barring some sort of further intervention from the federal government, Tom, what are you doing at KBW to attract deposits and to keep the ones you have? Um, well, my firm at KBW, we're, we're a securities firm, right. um, but I think that uh, I think that uh, uh, so we don't we don't attract deposits at KBW, so to speak. Um, but I think what I in talking to most banks in the industry, uh, they have the liquidity. There are plenty of ability, plenty of lines and avenues that a bank can go down to augment their liquidity. So my sense is that depositors' demands will be met. Um, and I think other banks are, some banks are seeing tremendous inflows from some of these other banks. So, so it's not e equal everywhere in the industry. Um, so I think things are steady enough as long as they don't get worse. That's my point. Well, Tom, do you expect uh, smaller and regional banks to have to pay more to attract uh, just regular depositors who think, well, why shouldn't we just put our bank at the big money centers that are too big to fail? Well, yes, I think the I think I think in the third quarter of last year is where the light switch went on, so to speak, in terms of deposit competition. Uh, and that happened because of the speed at which FDIC deposits have been shrinking because of monetary policy. So, so we saw that competition sort of green light happen in the third quarter. So I think, and, and it's not just the banking industry competing with itself, it's market rates. Uh, treasuries were offering a, a, a compelling alternative uh, to deposits. So, so that competition was building, and that's how, how uh, funds have been draining out of the system so much. Hey, Tom, so, uh, yeah. I've got to run. I've just got a headline I need to get to. Thanks for being with us this morning. Tom, Tom thank you. Of KBW. A time for the president. <clears throat> He's going to speak on a banking system 9 a.m. Eastern time. So 9 a.m. Eastern time. So about an hour and five minutes from now is on the schedule. This is the move we need to talk about in the two year. Yeah. We're down by 45 basis points, 413. Had a break of 410 just moments ago. I put this out on Twitter for you if you want to see the chart. Tom, I said the Fed decides when it's time to hike. The market usually decides when they're done, and the market is screaming, you're done. It, it's there, and the 10-year yield, as we just showed, is down on radio. These are extraordinary charts. That's all you need to uh, – and, you know, I don't know if you have ready yet, guys, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. You can take it back 20 or 50 days, and the answer is, John, I've never seen this. It's a compendium of 11 ratios, and, John, we were slightly restrictive – we were accommodative in the plunge to a new tightness, to a new restriction in the system. I would editorialize, we've never seen it before. There are two ways of looking at this. One is, yes, the market is right, they're done. The second is this. The moves announced yesterday allow the Federal Reserve to keep on going and to focus on inflation because they know they've got the tools to deal with a failed institution. That's going to be the other way of looking at this. Now, I'm not going to offer my view on the situation, Tom. I'm just establishing the two ways through which people will observe the current situation. One is that the Federal Reserve is done. That's captured by this market right now. The other is <clears throat> what was announced yesterday gives them the tools to carry on hiking. Well, within the trauma and with the president speaking, it also does come down to what's it going to do to the economy. I mean, suddenly the Atlanta GDP now statistic perhaps needs adjustment. The president of the United States addressing the nation and Wall Street, too, in about an hour from now. Clearly, the banking system is telling us that there's some kind of issue here. And I would say, Lisa, that money has been shut down. The banking system, for the first time, really, is dealing with negative deposit growth year over year. We don't see this as a systemic crisis, nothing compared to 08, 09, or 1990. I cannot believe that what's happening in the banking sector will not give the Fed pause in this market. This is almost like the opposite of the global financial crisis. And now the fears are way out there. 
when the banks are more resilient than they've been in a generation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, across this nation, around the world this morning. There is financial crisis. The president of the United States will speak in the 9 o'clock hour. John, what are we going to hear from President Biden? Well, let's deal with the politics first, Tom. I think this administration is probably very nervous about this being characterized as a bailout. That politically won't play well. So they're going to go through things piece by piece and really point out that in the European phrasing of this, Tom, we call this a bail-in. Right. Equities and debt shareholders, they don't get anything. They get bailed into the whole process. No bailout for them. But ultimately, there is a lifeline here for Wall Street banks. And that lifeline has been provided, TK, from the Federal Reserve with that new lending facility, allowing them to place securities that are deeply, deeply underwater. Right, right. Post that collateral at par at the Federal Reserve. And that's a big development yesterday. And the news moving is, John, I don't think you saw this as you uh, worked on that question here. Red and green on the screen. Market's quite volatile. We've told you about uh, the bond market. Moments ago, the rework here of the Silicon Valley Bank, the gentleman from the Fannie Mae coming in to begin to run that shop here, all moving in real time before the president. And, John, to me, what this shows is the immediate urgency to figure out where the haircut's going to be on troubled banks, troubled bonds, and let's work this out now. In the meantime, this market is screaming, Dear Jay, you're done. You're done. Yeah. And it's screaming that this morning. Now, I have no idea if that's going to be ultimately where we end up at the next meeting of the Federal Reserve or later this year. But to see the two-year down another 41 basis points, pricing out rate hikes in the back end of the year, pricing in more rate cuts, Tom, that's the argument right now. And if you're just tuning in, there's two very clear camps. One is the market is right, they're done. Two... What was announced yesterday <clears throat> will allow this Federal Reserve to say, look, we've got the tools to deal with failed banks and we can carry on focusing on inflation. Right. Now, what would be helpful is some Fed speak for once. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're not going to get well, it. It's the quiet period for the Federal Reserve. Key headline I mentioned an hour ago. Did I see this coming? To be honest, no. Brent crude, that global oil price, Lisa, under $80 a barrel. It's not Dow 10,000, but it signals the linkage here of all we're talking about into the global GDP and American GDP. GDP call. To put these two things together, the idea of fewer rate hikes or even no more rate hikes and actually the Fed cutting rates is viewed as a negative because it comes on the heels of potential true distress. And I think that one of the key questions is how much do lending standards, to Michael Shaul's point, how much do lenders, lending standards tighten really meaningfully over the next couple of months in a way that hadn't been well, anticipated that really accelerates some of the disinflationary process without the Fed having to raise rates further? And if it doesn't, what does that mean in terms of the dual mandate for a Federal Reserve that's looking at inflation that's running at the hottest pace still going back 40 years? John, what would Powell say? Uh, the president speaks at 9. The secretary of Treasury comes out at 12, maybe 3 p.m. ish. The chairman comes out and has to make, you know, comments from a, a written statement. And he says them into a super restrictive America. That's where we've turned since Friday. I don't know what he'd say, but I know what my question would be. Is policy now in conflict? for the Federal Reserve? Do you have to deal with financial stability <clears throat> risk and elevated inflation simultaneously the, at the same time? How difficult is yeah. that? Do you have the tools to deal with one at the same time you have the tools to deal with the other? Right. Now, the government of the Bank of England had some experience of this back in September. And, yeah, Very October, unique situation, yes, yes, different yes. to this, I get all that. But they really wanted to communicate that we have the tools to deal with one and the tools to deal with another. I think Lisa's right, just to lean on what we heard in the last hour from Michael Shaw. Michael talked about lending standards are going to tighten up in the United States of America. Banks are going to have to be more mm -hmm. conservative. Why? Because CEOs, shareholders, right. debt holders got wiped in those bank failures. Yes, depositors are made whole. We understand that based right. on the developments of yesterday, Tom. But if you're running one of these banks, all of a sudden you've got to run your institution maybe a little bit more tightly uh, than you were previously. We had three breaking headlines here. Let's get out front of the next headline here. Moments ago, Lisa, on lower lows, Credit Suisse breaks down. Not quite to lows for the day, not quite to record lows, but the stock acting terribly. We haven't necessarily seen the end, at least in the pricing, not only of Credit Suisse, but other banks, which raises a question, why not? If this is really just a crisis of confidence, why was the move by, uh, by U.S. authorities over the weekend not enough to stave some of the concern about perhaps more bank runs or perhaps greater weakness right. in some of the weaker financial now, institutions?
institutions. Let's get to it uh, right now. John, do we need to do any data? Is there any data there screaming? Uh, Tom, to be honest with you, we'd be here all day because yeah. I'd carry on, carry on speaking and no one wants that. <laughs> Subhadra <laughs> just uh, emailed me, no, tell John not to do a data check. Subhadra Rajapa joins us right now on this historic day with society uh, in general. Subhadra, I, I want to speak, I think, towards what the president will comment on here. What can we glean from the fixed income markets that can help politicians gauge the moment? What should they be watching in fixed income? Well, they're not watching anything specifically in the fixed income market per se, but what I think we should be encouraged by is the fact that financial condi conditions are still relatively easy. You're not seeing uh, a meltdown in the, in the equity market. You're not really seeing broader risks of a contagion uh, in all markets. This seems to be very localized, uh, if you will. In the bond market, you're seeing a pretty dramatic decline in yields as the market starts to price out rate hikes for this year. So for the most part, at least thus far, it seems to be localized to the price action, I should say, in the bond market. And, the, and we're not really seeing a big risk of a contagion. Two things, Sabatra. One, you called for lower yields. <laughs> You're getting them in a major way this morning. We'll come back on that call in just a moment. The second thing, there's two clear camps emerging. We've been discussing them in the last hour or so. One is that the market is right. This Federal Reserve is done. The second camp is ultimately the Fed has shown it has the tools to deal with, deal with failed banks and can focus on tackling inflation. Which camp are you in? It's going to have to be the latter. I think it's very soon to make a call on the Fed being done. Like you guys have been discussing over the last couple of minutes, if you look at inflation, it's running very hot. You have a very strong labor market. And most importantly, financial conditions are easy. The financial stability risks seem to be somewhat ring-fenced and isolated with a couple of banks. The question really becomes one of, does the Fed have all the tools it needs to be able to contain this problem? And again, you know, you guys did a good job of outlining what happened in the UK. I think the parallels there are, are very prescient for this particular moment where the Fed can kind of thread the needle on two separate issues and continue to raise rates, uh, you know, in, uh, at, the, at the March meeting and even beyond if we can kind of deal with the, the problem at hand. Subhadra, I want to just talk about the mechanics of the bond market at a time when you're seeing a 50 basis point move in the two year, at a time when so many people had parked their cash in this debt. How much is this kind of creating fragilities in and of itself, that there is such incredible volatility in the benchmark basic instruments that people use as tools of safety? So if it is a tool of safety, you want to be long the bond. And we've been kind of talking about that. Uh, you know, pretty much uh, since the beginning of the year, even when yields started to rise, is that this is typically the sort of price action you tend to see in the bond market towards the end of the cycle where the market gets a little bit very skittish on uh, the potential turn in policy. Uh, so especially given the fact that yields have risen so dramatically, our view has consistently been that the risk to yields are asymmetrically <clears throat> skewed towards the downside. And that's exactly what you're, you're seeing in, in, the, in the price action. Yes, the, the moves look very dramatic, and that's because the absolute level of the two-year was at five, uh, five, above 5% 5 you know, just a week ago. So a lot of that repressing is going to happen in the very front end. So that doesn't surprise me uh, at all. Um, but what, you know, what we have to see going forward is not really read too much into the price action here. This could be partly driven by position unwinds, given the fact that the market was extraordinarily short heading into the into the March FOMC meeting. But I think cooler heads will prevail when you have more information on how this route is going to play out, broadly speaking. How are you going to play this, Subhadra? Are you going to lean into the long end? Are you going to basically cash in on some of the short positions you've had, the short, uh, short end of the curve? Uh, we really didn't have any, any shorts. I think we've been kind of leaning long uh, in, in bonds for a good portion of this year. Uh, given the fact that, you know, it's really hard to call the pivot on policy. Uh, so it's it's kind of, uh, you know, especially given the fact that you get such good returns in bonds, uh, our bias was was perhaps to play from from the long end because, yes, we might lose the last 25 basis points of, of rate hikes or, or not be able to know where the terminal Fed funds rate is. But broadly speaking, the market's going to look towards a trajectory of lower yields 
over the next uh, year or two. So in that sort of context, I think that long play made sense. That said, we've moved quite significantly lower here. So I think it, we probably take a pause, look at how things evolve. I wouldn't be surprised if we see another uh, leg higher in yields uh, if we start to price in uh, more hikes as, as the time progresses, given the fact that we've, we're not anywhere near achieving uh, the goal on inflation. So, Badra, your bond call is looking pretty good this morning and over the last couple of days, that's for sure. So, Badra Jaffa there of Sogen. So, Badra, thank you. Tracy Alloway of Bloomberg out on Twitter just moments ago. She said this, and I'm looking forward to the Odd Lots podcast around this story with Joe Weiss and Tal. I'm sure they'll put a few out over the next couple of weeks. 20. A bank with subpar risk management and flaky depositors just changed the US financial system forever. Tom, there's many dimensions to this story, but that take is an important one. It's an important one because Tracy has legitimate San Francisco tech cred in her travels. She spent a lot of time out there. So if I say flaky, I sound like an idiot. She says flaky, it's valid. When I quote her, is that okay? <laughs> no, that's, that's a, no, I'm serious. Flaky, flaky Tracy, works. Tracy is hardwired to that. John Credit Suisse moments ago yeah. breaking down. We are moments away from testing true new lows. You begin to wonder, a one handle in Swiss francs and Credit Suisse, we're not there yet. It came close earlier, 211. Right now, 216. <clears throat> Just off session lows, we're down a little more than 13%. Futures on the S&P session lows right now. We're down six tenths of one percent from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Bloomberg has learned Russian President Vladimir Putin plans to meet top business leaders in the Kremlin this week for the first time since he launched the invasion of Ukraine. The March 16th gathering with the top members of the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs comes as a government which is struggling to cover rising spending as the war enters its second year, steps up pressure on companies to pay more in taxes. The Wall Street Journal reporting Chinese leader Xi Jinping plans to speak with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky for the first time since the start of the Ukraine war. Bloomberg has learned the visit will likely come after Xi meets with Russian President Vladimir Putin as soon as next week. And Xi Jinping has started an unprecedented third term as China's president with fresh vows to ensure stability and strengthen party leadership. In a speech closing out the annual National People's Congress, he vowed to oppose foreign interference in Taiwan, a veiled reference to increasing American support for the government in Taipei. U.S. authorities took extraordinary measures to shore up confidence in the financial system after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, introducing a new backstop for banks that Federal Reserve officials say is big enough to protect the entire nation's deposits. The Treasury Department, Federal Reserve and Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation followed a frantic weekend that saw the surprise closure of New York's Signature Bank along with mounting concerns about spillover effects to other regional lenders and the wider economy. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. City banks are in, or decent banks are in a very different place than you know the regional community banks. I think the market will continue to suss that out. Uh, but you know, if you go back to uh, SVB, it was an outlier in almost every metric that um, one could look at. So to me, it's far from systemic. I think this is just a, a snap reaction more than anything else. Greg Peters of PGM there. Well, for the regulator, it was systemic. They used the systemic exception and came out and said, we're going to make all depositors whole. So that tells you a lot about how they viewed the situation. From New York City this morning, good morning. A lot of you have written in. Thank you for that, including Bill Lee of the Milken Institute. He said this. He said, regulatory support from the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, are the appropriate ways to deal with bank execs' risk management failures and liquidity shortfalls. Monetary objectives, Bill says, should not be compromised with non-systemic bank failures. We keep using this phrase, non-systemic. Well, the way they treated it yesterday, Lisa, there was a fear that it might be. Well, there was a fear that it might be, and they took actions. And you're still seeing the fallout in shares, which raises a question of, A, 
it, was it systemic? B, was it enough? And C, what does this mean longer term, especially at a time, to Billy's point, where you do still have an inflation problem and you still have to have a policy to combat that? I would go OBE. They're going to become overcome by events, and that's why the market's open now and it's of good value. I've got Brent crude going down to new lows, $78.85. And Global Oil, John, seventy two seventy seven on West Texas Intermediate. We begin to think about a 60 handle uh, there. We can go on and on, but the markets are reacting, and that changes the political dialogue that Bill Lee knows so well. In a major way, Lisa mentioned some of those single names. First <clears throat> Republic, pick one, it's down 64% in the pre-market. Go to Europe, to Switzerland, pick another. The beleaguered Credit Suisse is down by almost 13% at 217 and just about holding on to a two-handle. And I go to the bond market too, TK, here. This move yeah. at the front end of the curve. Can't take my eyes <clears> off it. We're down more than 40 basis points on a two-year. This market at the moment, yeah. not my view, just this market at the moment is screaming to the Fed, we think you're done. Key idea, Bob, the, the oil just breaks through to new low. To me, John, I agree, the two-year yield breaking down below 0 0.50 would be a new retest. This just coming out from Andrew Hollenhorst to Bill Lee's point. He thinks that markets are once again underpricing how high Fed policy rates will need to rise and how long they will stay there and still reaffirms right. the potential for 55 to 575% terminal Fed funds rate at a time when right now the market has it priced at about a percentage point below that. George Bush the Younger, 15 years ago, a September evening. Over the past few weeks, many Americans have felt anxiety about their finances and their future. I understand their worry and their frustration. Perhaps copy for the President of the United States here in 45 or so minutes. Joining us, our Bloomberg financial crisis correspondent in Washington. Anne-Marie Horton. Anne-Marie, just simply, you've been listening, reporting on this, listening to White House people. What is the zeitgeist at the White House as the president will speak to the nation? Well, I think it's a massive lack of sleep at the White House this weekend. These individuals across the White House, the Treasury, FDIC, have been working over the weekend to put this plan in place. And the president is going to speak at 9 a.m., something, you know, we weren't really expecting over the weekend. But then after last night's news, uh, they've come out and said he's actually going to address the American people. I think Jonathan make a, made a really good point earlier, which is that this administration wants to make sure to everyday Americans that this was not a bailout. The these depositors that even if you are below the threshold, these depositors all being insured, that statement said all money would be returned and you have access to it today. They want to make sure that they know that, that is not taxpayer dollars. That's going to be one thing I think the president will want to emphasize. And I'll also want to talk about the fact that they had to move promptly because I guess that means they were concerned of potential risks further in the, in the financial uh, markets, and they wanted to protect everyday consumers. The other thing is you can expect, the president said in his statement, I am firmly committed to holding those responsible for this mess fully accountable and to continuing our efforts to strengthen <clears throat> oversight and regulation of larger banks who are not in this position again. That opens up a field of what Congress could potentially do following this chaos. So this goes back to 2018. The Trump administration, the Republicans, there was a bill to unwind some of the regulation around smaller lenders, smaller banks, regionals. MH, I believe there were 17 Democrats that voted alongside Republicans on that bill. Are we saying that they're going to push to unwind much of that in the coming months? Well, there was 17 uh, Democrats that voted alongside Republicans for that bill. Jonathan, you are correct. You have to look at some of who some of these individual, individuals were. They were in states that Trump won. So politically, this is something that they wanted to lean into because a lot of them were up for re-election. And then there was just a handful as well. There's a lot of bank lobbyists out uh, in full force during this time trying to get them to unwind some of this. Many of them, like uh, the, the one of the Dakota senators, um, Heidi Henkamp, had come out and said, that they don't understand the rural regional issues we are facing. So the issue now is, will those Democrats, some that are still senators today that voted for this, like Senator uh, Warner of Virginia, Senator Coons of Delaware, would they be on board of rolling back that deregulation? We already heard from Senator Elizabeth Warren. We've already heard from Senator Bernie Sanders. They are saying that 2018 law needs to be deregulated. But for Trump, he said this was a bipartisan issue because 17 of those Democrats signed up for it. What's going to be the consequence for some of the management teams of banks that do have to tap into the resources, that do uh, struggle with some of the potential mark-to-mark -mark losses on portfolios that they did have control over? 
I think what you're going to see in terms of consequences in Washington is that there will be hearings in Congress. I mean, that that is almost without a doubt. There will be hearings, um, for certainly for SVB, certainly for Signature Bank. You could expect Congress to call these individuals uh, the C-suite of these companies before the Hill and testify on what went wrong and try to draft how they can avoid this in the future. MH, just pushing forward, the brilliant David Weston is going to stand aside. He's going to focus on Wall Street Week through the rest of this year. I'm looking forward to his coverage. You're going to step in with Joe Matthew to Balance of Power. I understand the time of that's going to move, so it's going to be at 5 p.m. Eastern time, a little bit later this afternoon. AMH, first show today. What a way to kick it off. I mean, I mean it's a slow news day. It it's off, a way right? they can ease into it's it. It's almost like AMH engineered it. <laughs> and Marie, what are you focused on a little bit later? I think today we have to focus on the conversation we just had right now. What is yeah. going to the response from Washington following this collapse of SVB, this swift and prompt decision from Treasury, the White House, and the FDIC, and what comes next, right. and how do we prevent this in the future? Because it's a kickoff show here, have you efforted Chairman Powell? I mean, I think that would be a good conversation. <laughs> uh, I, made, I, made, I made a few requests. Yeah, yeah Powell, the <laughs> Treasury Secretary. But seriously, do we hear from Yellen and Powell today, Anne-Marie? Well, we're first going to hear from the president, and I think he'll probably leave it there, maybe send out some deputies. I mean, we heard from Secretary Yellen over the weekend. She went on Face the Nation. Yeah. I doubt we are going to hear from Chair Powell. Remember, he just had two hearings last week, another kind of awkward moment. Remember all those Republicans were telling him, warning him to ease up on the capital requirements for banks just last week. Can you imagine if we redid the hearings again this week, just how different they'd be? I just They'd be so different, Tom. I, but my recollection of 08, long ago and far away, it seems like it was yesterday, is it was the same ugliness there where you looked at some authority and what they said three days before was embarrassing. Just changes. And we're looking forward to the show a little bit later with Joe Matthew, 5 p.m. Eastern time. That's Balance of Power on TV and radio. In the next hour on Bloomberg TV, massive lineup, loads of people offering their views on the situation. Peter Shear of Academy... Michael Contopoulos of Richard Bernstein Advisors, Amy Will Silverman of RBC, Ken Leon of CFRA. I believe Julian Emanuel is going to pop on the phone as well from Evercore to give his view on a situation, Tom, with this market making a big move in bonds, making you, a huge you move. talk about Julian Emanuel, and that's something we have not talked about. This crisis, if we get the Evercore ISI view on disinflation, forget about the crisis, but if we get a disinflation vector that begins to move towards five-ish, four-ish, three-ish, how does that change everything we've talked about this morning? We've barely discussed the data this yeah. morning. It's not just CPI tomorrow. <clears throat> it's retail sales on Wednesday. I, Last yes. week, I think I started the week, we had all these conversations about 50, and then Chairman Powell basically talked about increasing the pace and maybe open the door to it. We sat here, I said it repeatedly, every conversation we have is at the mercy of Friday's data and Tuesday's data, and then all of a sudden... <laughs> it's not relevant it's, at all, we don't care. It's so much more than that, Lisa. Well, the long and variable lags, it's suddenly becoming relevant again. Are we there in terms of the long and variable lags? And that seems to be the implication of markets. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley says those long and variable lags I have arrived, Tom. They're here right now. 35-year chart, almost back to Volcker. The log slope of Fed action is unprecedented. How quickly they moved. Equity futures, negative four-tenths of 1% from New York City. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome all of you on radio and television to an American crisis. The president will address the nation in the 9 o'clock hour. Help me out here if you can, Amy. We're talking 900-915. Do we know when the president will talk? It's it right will at be 9 in the 9 o'clock hour, as he is wont to do. And maybe we'll hear from Secretary Yellen as well. Right now we're going to hear on the difference between now and the chaos of yesterday which is the markets are open. So Lisa Bramlitz and I are going to address that. I'm going to see a little bit of red on the tape. There's a new lack of a bit on the tape. And Lisa, you've noticed the two-year yield is out to a shocking level. Well, we've been talking about this all morning, and the move just simply has accelerated. Do we get a sub-4% two-year yield today? <clears throat> right now, we're looking at 4.05% on that two-year yield. This, the move has been dramatic. When you take a look at Fed funds expectations, now we are pricing in a peak Fed funds rate of 4.7%, which then gets <clears throat> cut, and we're pricing in about 50 basis points of rate cuts, Tom, by the end of the year. 
is the inflationary picture disinflationary enough to justify a view in markets that seems to discount any potential for the Fed to move? I would suggest off your stock movers of the last hour, the idea of following FRC, First Republic Bank of California, seems to be the single American stock to follow this morning. Yeah, and there are a number of others as well as people try to parse mm -hmm. out which are the most vulnerable, even <clears> though <throat> we had a response that supposedly backstops depositors above $250,000. What you need to know on technology is people get chosen. There was a woman out of Minnesota who was exceptionally astute in operational research at Stanford, and she was anointed, I remember the day as clear as I can, Marissa Hu, was anointed as the leader of Yahoo. Many would say she at least stabilized the company and moved it along in its eventual pain. The gentleman that found her was Michael J. Wolf. He's co-founder and CEO of Activate, is a unique voice for technology in this country, his work with MTV, but far more with consulting with McKinsey and all. He is a voice that when he gets, when he, it's, lot, it's Michael Wolf on line two, they answer the phone. What did you do this weekend? Were you glued to the phone this weekend? Well, it, it was a dark weekend for startups and for venture capital firms. And either on Twitter, either on message boards and really blowing up my texts <clears throat> over the weekend because where people were afraid, startups mm -hmm. and VCs were concerned that they wouldn't make payroll this coming week. Right. And they were concerned that come Monday they'd have to start um, letting people right. go. I want you to address the behavioral construct that was beautifully described by the Wall Street Journal, anecdote after anecdote, and I'm not going to mince words, Michael. It was fancy tech guys with fancy educations on fancy golf streams from Big Sky in Montana flying back quickly to Northern California to salvage the mess. That is the image that America has of your world. Is it accurate? Well, what's ironic is that in a lot of ways the venture capitalists started that. And so it's the immediacy of social media. So starting on Wednesday, they already started advising their startups to take money out. And by Thursday, you know, over $40 billion had already left Silicon Valley Bank. Right. And so in a lot of ways, this was self-imposed. And what's, what's different about this versus 2008 was you had, at that time, you had Twitter that had 200,000 daily users. Today, all of the communication is happening through social media. And so well, it's not surprising you had a run on the bank. And what was so important in the quality threads this week and the people that weren't hysterical was Brad Setzer, wonderful at Harvard and Oxford. And at the end of his thread, Lisa, he was scathing about the lack of humility among tech types. Gary Gensler out uh, with this statement from the SEC uh, that they are investigating and bring enforcement actions if we find violations of the federal securities laws. This raises questions of what potential conflicts some of these individuals had. Was that one of the discussions that people were having over the weekend? No, the main thing was this concern about what this meant for startups themselves and this concern overall for people outside the technology business about what would this do to the innovation that's been taking place. I mean, these were not big companies. These were th companies, thousands of small companies who've, yes, taken in venture capital money, but, um, but there's concern that this would shut down innovation, that VCs would not be able to finance companies come this week or these coming months. Michael Shaul was on earlier, and he was saying that regardless of what happens and what the Fed is trying to do in the Treasury Department to offset some of the concerns about a failure to be able to withdraw with deposits, that lending conditions would tighten materially and that some of these smaller companies would face much higher standards to borrow and much higher rates. Is that in the conversations that you're having with and some of these startups? Th absolutely. I think they're worried about what happens ev even though the Fed is going to backstop the bank and their, and their funds are going to be available. I think their concern is, will this have a chilling effect on venture capital funding and will this have a chilling effect on the places where they can borrow money? And in a lot of cases, though, they're, they're, many of them are expecting to keep their money at Silicon Valley Bank. Over the weekend, a group of venture capitalists, uh, Kleiner Perkins and, and others, and General Catalyst, they put out a statement that said, no matter what happens, that they'll back Silicon Valley Bank. Now, there's also, if you look at some of the anecdotes, companies weren't even set up to take money into other places. Some of the founders were putting money into their personal accounts as they were able to transfer it out.
Is there a discussion about some of these venture capital firms helping some of their portfolio companies to actually uh, meet payroll to deal with some of their uh, concerns on their imminent funding requirements? Right. They're, they're really, based on the conversations I was involved in, there really weren't, that was not an option on the table. Mm -hmm. I think that everybody was looking at this, and in fact, they were concerned about the laws in California in terms of what happens with missing payroll. Michael Wolf, one of the sane voices this weekend, he was cryptic, but nevertheless sane, was a guy named Dan Loeb. There were others that were a little more hysterical, all caps in that, mouthing off uh, in a time of true financial crisis. How do we get a behavior change in your world that affects a humility towards the entirety of America away from hyper-educated finance and technology elite? Yeah, I think that what's happening, though, is the world is moving away. The te innovation world is already moving away from Silicon Valley. It used to be you started a company, you could only be located one place, and that was the Bay Area. Yeah, Some Steve Case is led on that. Let's be clear, the guy from AOL, Steve Case, is really led on that. Absolutely, but when we move into new technologies like generative AI and self-driving cars and even the metaverse, it's in other places. And I think that, that, that yeah, Silicon my, Valley mafia will change. Yeah, but I didn't hear Dan Loeb this weekend talking about the metaverse, and most of the people watching this show are going, Michael, what the hell is it? We won't know for five years. How do we reconnect? Connect Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Stanford, Caltech, and other elite in Georgia Tech, Purdue, that's my pick in the NCAA. How do we connect technology engineering back with an America where the stereotype is they're flat on their back? Right. I think that it, some of it's going to come down to innovation hubs. So Boston, in a lot of ways, and Cambridge, those are going to be places, and other, and other places around Austin and others where you've got people, um, and, and it's also opening up the world. I mean, a lot of these tech jobs have gone away. Those people are all going to find work, but they're not going to necessarily find work in Silicon Valley. They're going to find it in other companies and mainstream businesses. We've been talking about the potential fallout and the interconnectedness of markets that previously had been somewhat separate. And I wonder about stable coins, for example, the sort of crypto asset that is pegged to assets that, for example, I'm thinking of the USD coin that had a lot of its assets parked at the Silicon Valley Bank. And suddenly it broke the buck, right? It went beyond $1, which was sort of the backing of its, uh, of its assets. I mean, how do you view that in terms of casting a real pall that has a permanence to it over asset classes that previously were heralded as the winners of the crypto winter. Yeah, I mean, there, there, by the way, is the real arrogance, which is this idea that this wouldn't have happened if we had decentralized finance and, and blockchain. Yes, USD, USD coin, um, it's supposed to be, it's a stable coin, it's supposed to always be stable at a dollar. It dropped down to 87 cents over the weekend. And um, USD had $3 billion on deposit. Right. So it is going to have a chilling effect on, <clears throat> on crypto. It is going to make right. people wonder, is this a viable place? Is it safe? John from England emails in. John says, can you ask him if it was a bailout? Was this a bailout for younger Michael Wolf Turks from another time and place? Well, I mean, this what's, this is very different. It's a bailout, but it's very different than 2000. Agreed. 2008. Okay, fine. But was this, it a bailout? No, I think this is a, this was about about liquidity. It wasn't the, this is not a bank that made, that made risky investments in, in mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. This is a bank that had a liquidity problem. They made bad mistakes in terms of their investments, right. and ultimately, um, we, a lot of that money will come back. If if you see, I don't mean to interrupt, but we're running out of time. This is too important. If you were asked to serve on the board of the new SVB bridge, what would be your advice? Um, I think that, that you better be an expert in finance, uh, and you better have uh, really understand the kinds of credit risk officers and other people that are in place. Michael, we got to go because the news is just rip-roaring here as we're 30 minutes away from the president of the United States. Michael, on short notice, thank you for coming in thank today. You. Michael Wolf is Quite at Activate, <laughs> which barely describes his history with McKinsey, Yahoo, and others. Lisa, I was watching this as you were talking to Michael, and, uh, you know, the, the phrase we use on a normal day is there's no bid on the screen except it's so complex. 
complex in this crisis. Or there's a rip-roaring bid at the front end of the yield curve because everybody just wants to pile in to Seven short end. Seven basis points which since Michael started at talking. Sub four percent to your Treasury yields, the lowest levels you that we saw that. going back to October fourth. Three point nine nine percent. Come didn't back call a little that. bit, uh, back around four oh, percent even. I'm looking at this and wondering what is the bet? <clears throat> the bet is no more rate hikes and rate cuts by the end of the year at a time when inflation still is rip roaring. But as we keep hearing, conditions are tightening. Lending conditions are tightening. Is it enough, though, Tom? And this is really going to be the key question. Is it enough to curtail inflation that's running no. at the fastest pace in 40 years if the Fed doesn't hike anymore and even starts cutting rates by the end of this We're year? We're not going to be inflammatory about it in terms of naming individual names and guessing what they're going to be doing in the next hour or so. But certainly, it's very fragile into the discussion that the president will give. What do you expect to see from the president? I mean, it's got to be prepared Mark, does he come in and do one of those quick stand-ups walk-off thing? <laughs> it's going to be, this is not a bailout, this is not a bailout, this is not a bailout. Thanks, Sia. <laughs> I mean, the, this is going to be <laughs> trying you. to basically say, quote you on look, <laughs> look, this is going to be an issue where they're going to say, <clears throat> we did what we had to do to make sure that these you know, innovative companies could meet payroll. We're going to take the actions that we need to to support mm. our banking system, but it's not a bailout. And we continue to expect uh, combating inflation. Oh. Thank you. No questions. On radio and television, <laughs> please expecting. stay with us. As we look to this, we look to technology in this half hour, Michael Wolf with us. And I'm thrilled to tell you, and no, we're not going to talk basketball. Joining us, a gentleman from Bain Capital and a senior advisor, Steve Paliuka. Last time we talked as a sport in this crisis, we will speak to him of the shadows of the private markets. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Norway, NATO forces are gathered for joint drills as the defense alliance, along with Russia, China and others, compete for greater control of the Arctic. Estimates suggest the region holds around one fourth of the globe's oil and natural gas resources. Meanwhile, Ukraine's interior minister says Russian missiles and artillery have destroyed more than 152,000 residential buildings since the start of the invasion. In his first public comments since taking office, Premier Li Zheng says China will protect the rights of entrepreneurs and continue to support private businesses. He also downplayed the importance of Beijing's modest economic growth target of around 5 percent, saying citizens are more focused on issues that affect their daily lives rather than the pace of the gross domestic product. U.S., Australia and U.K. leaders will announce plans for a new fleet of nuclear-powered submarines as they deepen the AUKUS defense partnership aimed at countering China in the Pacific. Upgrading Australia's aging subfleet is a linchpin of that effort. President Biden will meet in San Diego today with U.K. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to unveil plans to develop the new submarine. And a film made for less than $20 million was the big winner at the Oscars, picking up Best Picture and six other trophies. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once by independent studio A24 won out over some of the highest grossing pictures in Hollywood history. Avatar The Way of Water and Top Gun Maverick, which between them have taken close to $4 billion at the box office, scored just one Oscar apiece. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I don't think this is likely to be a broadly systemic uh, problem. But it certainly is going to have very substantial consequences for Silicon Valley, for the economy of the whole venture uh, sector, which has been dynamic, unless uh, the government is able to assure that this situation is worked through. In the defense of the former Secretary of Treasury, Lawrence Summers, there on Wall Street Week, that was taped uh, a little bit uh, prior to the festivities of the weekend. Like a lot of other people, he is monitoring, I'm sure, 
uh, the moment we're in tick by tick. We're going to get to a very important voice here in a moment, but Lisa, uh, moments ago, the VIX over 30 is a significant sign for equity participants. The VIX, not just uh, measuring volatility in stocks, but also in bonds, the move index hitting its highest level going back to uh, early December as people expect this volatility <clears throat> in bond yields to continue and p potentially accelerate in the weeks to come. Some of it is a grind looking to Switzerland and Zurich, Credit Suisse and Swiss francs is grinding out to new weakness. We're not quite through to the record lows seen early, early uh, this morning. We see it in some of the selected stocks in finance in America uh, as well. And I'd also point within the bond market the dynamic of a real yield in 18 basis points for global Wall Street, 1.22 on the real yield is a shock. It is a highly restrictive environment. Moments ago, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index showing a restriction of negative 0 0.80. That may be Greek to you, but to Wall Street, that is a sign of a tighter economy, a tighter finance. That is something familiar in times of crisis to Stephen Paliuka, joining us now, senior advisor at Bain Capital. The last time we spoke, I believe it was of a basketball team in Boston. We will not do that today and we will speak of this crisis. Steve, you are a venerable advisor to all of technology. Give us one vignette of a conversation this weekend. Oh, many, many conversations. Uh, uh, all the technology firms and, and companies and startups um, were, were basically shaken by this event because uh, pro probably half of them had money uh, with, with the bank. And uh, and so uh, there was a mad scramble on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, which basically started the, the contagion and, and ended up with the bank in, in liquidation. Um, so the conversations were, you know, how do we make payroll? How do we protect uh, our capital that we had with, with what was seemingly a safe bank? I should point out also, folks, are beginning to see images of the president's speech uh, being set up here, a podium and the flags uh, of the White House. We'll look for that in the nine o'clock uh, hour. Steve Pagliuca, I want to talk about a new humility, the hallmark of people like Steve Pagliuca, a guy that owns a, a, a football team in England, and I think it's called the Red Sox in Boston. You guys had a built-in humility Many would say that drifted away in the boom here and in the Biden stimulus and the massive cash move into technology. How does the industry get back a new humility in crisis? Well, you know, unfortunately, the industry has gone through this several times before. Um, as, as you know, you're around in kind of the crash, the tech crash in 99, which was driven by over exuberance and values and Internet companies. And uh, this one, this one has been a little bit similar, uh, driven by Web3 um, uh, crypto, Bitcoin, um, all, all sorts of uh, blockchain, um, all sorts of exuberance, and prices have, have kind of come down. Venture investment has slowed. When there's obviously too much of a supply of anything, you get a, a counter reaction, and that's what's happened here, and that contributed to, uh, to the downfall of, of, of a bank that specialized in that area. We were just talking with Michael J. Wolf, uh, and we were speaking earlier with uh, Michael Shaul, uh, talking about tighter lending conditions going forward for some of these smaller companies, the venture capital world, the private equity world. Are you seeing that <laughs> among some of your portfolio companies? Are you seeing the likelihood and the expectation of it being more difficult to borrow? Um, yes, it, 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 it certainly will not be the easy money. Uh, that, that doesn't include venture capital. That includes uh, the, the entire you know, corporate world. Interest rates are up. Um, banks are banks are, are are concerned about their spread and yields. So you're going to see a tightening, and we have seen that tightening as we move from a, you know, quantitative easing period where there was easy and cheap money. We're moving back to I, I would say the new normal right now. So we, you, last time we spoke, Steve, you talked about a golden era for credit, for private credit, I should say, and how this really seemed like a very fruitful area, not only for uh, the borrowers, but also for the lenders. Does this change your view at all at a time when Michael Shaw was saying that potentially we could see more shoes to drop within the private asset markets? It does not change my view. I, I think actually private credit will continue to grow dramatically. Um, you know, the difference of private credit and bank credit is Private credit are sophisticated investors that put money into, into funds and not like equity investors. And so if a private credit company you know, you know, lose, loses uh, value, it, it only affects those certain investors that doesn't have a systemic effect on the an economy. 
And there are many, many companies that that uh, have viable loans and, and they, they'll, they'll get those loans through, through private credit uh, as the bank market tightens up. So, so I'm still bullish on private credit. What about the equity side of things in the private markets? Again, uh, we've come off record high um, equity equity amounts and injections in venture capital, um, and, you know, unprecedented highs, and and now we're back to kind of a new normal where supply will meet demand. The, the, the unprecedented money going in raised all those valuations of those of those startup companies. I think to unsustainable levels. I've been saying that for a couple of years, and, and now they've kind of come back down. So so we we, we will get back down to a baseline mm -hmm. level with more reasonable value, valuations. I applaud the government for making this move and ensuring these deposits because this would have affected many good small companies. And so this was the, the move that needed to be made on, on a classic uh, bank run where, where the bank actually has a lot of assets. They were just written down from an accounting basis. And, uh, and so I think really the right thing to do to kind of save right. the tech economy. Steve, very quickly here, we've got to go because of moving markets. But Steve Paliuka, I'm fascinated at what the new internal rate of return looks like and the new length of a private agreement. Do you extend out and lower the internal rate of return, or can you do better in that coming out of crisis? You know, if you look at the track record of, uh, of private equity and certainly Bain Capital the last 34 years, uh, we've, we've maintained uh, about the same level of returns in, in the uh, kind of the, the, the 18 to 20 percent level uh, for all those periods through crisis, through not crisis, and had, had very good returns for investors. Uh, this is all an equation. And when interest rates go up, uh, as, you, as you've seen, values of companies go down. And But there'll still be companies that need capital, that need to grow. And private equity has done very well in, in driving those companies forward and, and that continue to be so. So returns should be uh, basically the same. Steve, thank you so much. Steve Paliuka with us, Bank Capital here. Thanks, Tom. Uh, giving us really appreciate it. What a, what a great hour, Lisa, talking with Michael Wolf and Steve Paliuka, trying to get straight talk from venerable people on uh, what's got to be a changed industry coming what's, out of this. What's so difficult right now is the psychological <clears throat> impact versus fundamentals and that fundamentals are being shaken by a, by a psychological response. I mean, the idea that pretty much everyone said this wasn't a systemic event when we heard about what was going on Thursday, Friday, and now suddenly it is systemic and it's affecting other banks. You're seeing Schwab come out and say it has significant liquidity, right. don't worry, its shares were down significantly, trying to shore up confidence. How do you parse this out into some sort of well, longer-term macro call on the, inflation? Well, you don't, but the answer is longer-term in terms of trust and confidence is trying to get to 4 p.m. this afternoon. And frankly, with Bitcoin trading 24-7 here, Bitcoin pulling back a little bit from the enthusiasms of two hours ago, maybe that's even more sensitive uh, with all. I do want to point out Bloomberg Technology, Caroline Hyde and Edward Ludlow uh, will be a valuable point of resource here in the coming uh, days. Can't say enough about that. Look for that on Bloomberg uh, a television. Futures negative 51, Dow futures negative 391. I'm sorry, Lisa, there's no bid and Credit Suisse moments ago breaking down right on the cusp of new lows, 2.14 Swiss francs. People are looking for what will be the next weakest link in the banking sector to go, <clears throat> even with some of the plans to try to stave off some of the uh, distress. This to me is the big question, right? If this isn't systemic, then does this change the scenario with respect to inflation, with respect to rate hiking at the time <clears throat> when you're seeing the market price well, out further rate hikes and price in rate cuts of about 50 basis points by the end of this uh, year. I'd like to sell forward to tomorrow and then on to retail sales. Inflation tomorrow. When's retail sales? Wednesday or Thursday? I don't even know. I believe it's but, Friday. I will check that Okay, right now. Friday. I was wrong. I was wrong twice there. But so they're typically with Bramo. I'm not wrong once. I'm no, you were right. Twice. I was wrong. Okay. So carry on. It's Wednesday. Okay. Well, it was a group wrong. Uh, but w what we do see here, folks, is the economic data. Is it of importance to a nation in financial crisis. Coming up in the next hour, the President of the United States with markets open will address this banking crisis. Please stay with us on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Good morning.